Hey, Bellator Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. Bellator kicks into high gear. What a comeback! Ah! With two top-ranked featherweights vying for a guaranteed title shot. Oh! Blind knee knockout artist Adam Boric. And there's that knee! Faces a red-hot Mads Brunel. Fantastic finish by Brunel. Loss. Former champ Phil Davis makes his return. Take the boom at the Saudi rock. Against the heavy fists of Julius Angliscus. Bellator MMA. Tonight, live on Showtime, where warriors rule. Tour 276 and a main card with major implications that will be felt for months to come in the world of Bellator MMA. Got to admit, it's a little chilly outside, but inside things are heating up. The main event tonight, we get Adam Boric going up against Mads Burnell. After tonight, we will have the number one contender, and they will be ready for what happens in a month from now. That is the McKee Pitbull 2 and the featherweight world title on the line because whoever wins tonight will put them in line for a shot at the title. Welcome to the Family Arena in St. Charles, Missouri. Amanda Guerra, two-time world champ Josh Thompson with you here on the Fight Desk. Big John and Mora are cage side. We'll get to them in just a second. But Josh, let's start with the main event. Adam Borg going up against Mads Burnell. You were lucky enough to have four title shots in your career. You're a two-time champ. Yes, we ensure you like that. Uh, that's enough of talking about your ego. But let's get an overall view of the main event because you were talking to me just a few minutes before we came on air. You said, look, this has the chance to be a really exciting fight. Why? is that it's not just an exciting fight for me it's a throwback fight and generally when you look back to the throw fight throwback fights in MMA there was always finishes because one person was really good at grappling or one person was really good at wrestling one person was very good at striking it's a style of contrast who could implement their game plan that led to finishes because whoever dominated that top position or that or that position on the feet that's what led to the finish okay so let's talk about game plan for each of these guys let's start with Adam Borch look he's coming into this on a three fight win streak that is great but that fight, that was four fights ago to Darian Caldwell. He lost. It shook him up a little bit. He was. He admitted that. He said, look, I, my confidence dropped. We need that confidence to be all the way back tonight. Are we going to see it? Yeah, he used other words besides what you just said. I was very polite. <laughs> yes, you, you were. Very busy, <laughs> Overall, he, we are used to seeing him being explosive, dynamic, everywhere that you want to see a fighter be at the top of his game. Guess what? He wasn't that way after that fight. Now he's building himself back up. His flying knees of Aaron Pico, his, the way he stick, puts together his combinations. He loves to use all of his tools in his toolbox. The issue is he hasn't been using them lately, but he says we're going to see that Adam Borch tonight. He said after that last win that his confidence was back. Hopefully we see that tonight because he's going to need it against a guy like Mads Brunel. Look, this is a bad man. Uh, we call him the submission spe specialist. Uh, say that five times fast there. Nine subs, seven have come in the first round. Talk about finishing an exciting fight. What are we going to see from him? He's not just a finisher. There's a lot of things that he does very well. His stand-up is underestimated. Most people don't look at him as a stand-up guy, but he's got really good stand him. But with Saul Rogers, when he fought, he was able to get takedowns on him. He was able to hit sweeps. He was able to get to that top position. And when he did, he really broke Saul Rogers down with his conditioning, his cardio, and his pressure. Okay, but when he gets to the top, there's a plethora, as Big John likes to say, of submissions that he can use. He's really good. He's most famous for his Japanese necktie, which I have felt victim to myself in training with him. He is Doesn't a good, stud. Huh? No, it does not feel good, by the way. <laughs> but he's good on the neck. He's good on the top. And he will rain down some ground up pound as well. 
solve when he gets to that top position. This, I'm telling you right now, has makes for the number one contender spot, but it's going to be an absolute outstanding fight. We cannot wait to watch that. Uh, look, we could have just that fight on the card, and it would be enough to watch. But the rest of the main card, it is absolutely phenomenal. We can't pick a favorite here. You get J.J. Wilson. This is a kid we haven't seen in about a year. He moved up to 155, says he feels good. He wants to stay undefeated, but Godzi will be his toughest opponent yet. Also still undefeated, a stud of a fighter, Johnny Eblen. But John Salter is a finisher. Only one of any of his fights has ever ended in decision. So you know that one's probably going to end in fireworks. And the co-main, Mr. Wonderful himself, Bill Davis, looking to upset Julius and Glixis here in Missouri in front of a hometown crowd. We're going to talk about all of them coming up. But for now, we'll send it down tomorrow. All right, Amanda, thank you very much. We are beginning tonight's proceedings with an amateur fight, but don't worry, partner, we're still getting paid. Nico Alcaraz and Stanton Ketcherside both going at it in the Bellator MMA cage. And when we go to the tail of the tape, let's focus on the rules of an amateur <laughs> contest, John, because they are different than the pros. There's no doubt there is some difference. You're going to be looking at three three-minute rounds. You can see we're looking at 4-0 versus 1-0. There's three three-minute rounds. You're going to be a difference. The knees, no knees allowed to the head. They are allowed to the body. No elbows at all. And when you talk about rotational leg locks, you can only do straight leg locks like a, like a knee bar. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Family Arena here in St. Charles, Missouri. As we kick it off tonight here at Bellator 276 with an amateur feature scheduled for three three-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing the blue corner first at six foot two, weighing in 185.2 pounds. His amateur record one and oh, he fights out of Farmington, Missouri, Stanton, the Crusader catcher side. across the cage his adversary out of the red corner at six foot one weighing in 185.6 pounds and as an amateur he's undefeated at four and oh by way of Spain he fights out of St. Charles Missouri Nico Alcaraz and when the bell rings the referee in charge Zach Tybris All right, gentlemen, you ready? You ready? Give us five. Both undefeated as amateurs. Alcaraz in the red gloves. A Lindenwood University alum. Lindenwood University here in St. Charles, Missouri. A couple of other Lindenwood University alums coming up on the main card. Recent title challengers, John Salter and Julius Unglixkus will be competing later tonight on Showtime. Man, talk about hitting the proverbial jackpot, and he, <laughs> catcher side, did that almost with the one, two, but John, I was talking about the fact two amateurs getting the bright lights of Bellator MMA, and you always talk about a potential audition. Well, these two representing a thriving amateur MMA scene in Missouri. Yeah, in Missouri here, we get a ton of amateur fights, and you can see you're gonna have elements in this fight where guys are gonna make mistakes. That's part about being in the amateurs, but both of them, catcher side landed a big right hand. You saw Nico Alcaraz returning it. Now we're seeing if they're gonna get into a grappling exchange. Big takedown by catcher side into side control. He started wrestling at the age of seven. He did three years of wrestling at Lindenwood Belleville. And wrestling is his strong suit, looking to uh, attack the neck of Alcaraz. And now Alcaraz working from his back. Yeah, you saw Alcaraz in the beginning, and this is what we're talking about. This is the amateurs, and they're going to make some mistakes. And you saw him reach his hand over the head. Then he realized, no, I need the underhook. He went for the underhook, almost got himself up. And you saw catcher side stopping that ability. This is what the amateurs are for. This is a learning process for both of these guys. One's 4 0, one's 1 0. Doesn't mean anything at this point. Alcaraz turns 25 March 21st. A plethora of uh, March birthdays on the card here tonight. Not only inside the cage, but 
Also inside the Bellator MMA mobile trucks, family members of Bellator family members celebrating birthdays in March. So, John, if you're celebrating a birthday in March, happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. I'll take one. <laughs> Final minute here as Catcher Side takes down Alcaraz and has him pinned along the fence. And Catcher Side has shown his uh, striking side. He's also shown his wrestling because I've watched, I watched Alcarez's earlier amateur fights. No one was taking him down. Oh, and Alcarez almost went down, and yet it's catcher side that's sporting a nasty mouse underneath his left eye. But again, he's had the more, uh, more eye-catching shots as catcher side. As Alcaraz trying to swing here with 15 seconds left. Again, a reminder, just three minute rounds and a naked shot there by catcher side. Uh, he could be arrested for indecent exposure hey. with a, a naked shot like that. That's, Telegraphed it all the way. That's a Josh Thompson raw dog. Appreciative crowd here again. Alcaraz from right here in St. Charles, Missouri, while catcher side fighting out of Farmington, Missouri. And, and as you can see, take a look at it. This is what I love about the amateurs is, look, everything's new. It's new for some of the corners. Some of the corners knew that right now we've got guys what's <laughs> not in his corner. He's very close to his opponent. And you look, you go, now you got to move over. These are the things that happen in amateurs, but amateurs is a great program. Take a look at this beautiful oh. right hand right there. You saw that almost dropped Alcarez. He landed several of these shots. It's not that it wasn't telegraphed, it was, but not enough for Alcarez to be able to see it in time for to make it miss. Catcher side, I think, had that round. He landed the bigger shots, he had the better wrestling. We'll see if Alcarez can make it up in round number two. Catcher side had a strong opening round, but failed to deliver on his fight. prediction of a first round submission. Went fishing, but also managed to do some damage with the strikes and of course Alcaraz sporting damage of his own courtesy or make that catcher side sporting damage of his own courtesy of Alcaraz so again three three minute rounds in the middleweight division and Alcaraz moves forward from the southpaw stance lands a one two goes for the high kick and gets taken down for his efforts momentarily yeah, right back to his feet but he's still catcher side still deep on that single leg Momentarily, Alcaraz was looking for the double wrist lock. Now looking to put all the weight on catcher's side, but gets back up to his feet and attacks the neck. He's got that neck. He's got the ability to attack it right now. Catcher's side eats a right hand on the exit. Alcaraz is 4-0 with three knockouts and a rear naked choke. So four wins, four finishes for catcher's side. Well, he's had one amateur fight, and that ended via knockout, and he was looking for the knockout with that right hand that lands. And there's a right hand over the top by Alcaraz, a minute gone. Hey, they're putting up a fight like you'd expect them to do, John. They are putting up a fight. If Alcaraz slows himself down, he can, if he gets the, the view, he's gonna see the catcher side drops that left hand a lot. And he can, he can time that motion and land a clean shot. And what may be lacking in technique sometimes, well, is made up for in terms of pure guts and excitement. Well, and you can, you know, if you take a look, you look at the color. I was looking at Alcaraz's face, all the colors out of it, which is telling you he's breathing hard because this is important to him. That adrenaline dump is part of fighting. It's part of learning this, but right now he's in a great position, ground and power wise. So what you're saying, he's thankful that the rounds are only three minutes Absolutely. instead of five as professionals. That's one of the reasons they are. Nice job. And now the job right in the crucifix. By Alcaraz as he neutralizes catcher side. A good bounce back round for Nico Alcaraz with a minute remaining in the second stance. And there's the top. Nice job with the Americana by Alcaraz. Once he got the top position on catcher side, he was pretty dominant. Moved to a dominant position. Went to the crucifix. Attacked the Americana. Gets the tap. Happy 25th birthday, March 21st for Nico Alcaraz. Improves to 5 0, all five fights. Come inside the distance. Second submission. First via far side, Americana top. Risk key lock as we take a look at the fight, John. Take a look. That right hand lands. I think it hurt. 
catcher side a little bit. That allowed Nico to get into the legs. He gets the takedown, and once he got the takedown, more quickly did not stay there for long. Landed a couple of punches from full guard, but quickly moved his position. Got to side control. Beautiful Americana right there. That's a nice tap, a nice win. 5-0 and as an amateur. Chris, come here. Chris, come here. Go, go, go. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Two minutes. Round number two, the tap by way of an Americana. The winner by submission still undefeated, Nico Alcala. Stanton catcher side unable to escape Alcaraz on this Saturday night suffering his first loss he gets submitted via Americana Alcaraz celebrating his birthday early with his fifth straight win who knows plenty of potential as a professional but still in the unpaid ranks hey two people have earned every one of their dollars we got Amanda Guerra and Josh Thompson at the fight desk I agree with myself. I don't know about Josh. What work do you do around here, Josh? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I noticed, though. Did you catch on to what Moro did? Alcatraz, Alcaraz. Yeah, he's good right. with everything. We're not as good as Moro. If anything, Moro should be paid uh, the most money. All right, look, we're going to talk about the main card coming up here. I want to talk about the co-main event. Phil Davis, Julius, and Glixis. Here are the rankings. Phil Davis sitting at number two. Julius and Glixis at number four. Do you see the champion? And, and this is a, you used the word round robin earlier. Both of these guys have faced the champion in the past year. They both lost to him, but they can use that against one another. How? Well, Phil Davis now has seen how to beat Inglis Kiss and how Nemkov had success with him with the takedowns, top control. He landed some great strikes, was able to dominate the striking as well. For Anglitskis, it was a step up in competition, but it also showed what he possessed. But with Phil Davis, he's got all the tools to do exactly what Nemkov did to Anglitskis. Land the heavy strikes, throw the kicks, land the boxing, as well as get in there on deep on the takedowns and control that top position. We have complained about Phil Davis forever not utilizing his wrestling. He did against Joel Romero, former Olympic silver medalist, and was just dominating him with his wrestling. I feel like you're going to see Phil go to the well early on those takedowns against Anglitskis. When it comes to Anglitskis, uh, look, he, he lost to Nemkov, but Phil Davis has lost twice to him. How does, how does he look at that and find a recipe to beat Phil Davis? Well, the way you look at it is like Nemkov was able to beat Phil Davis twice, so Anglitskis can look at that and say, how did he get it done? Well, the way he got it done was by sticking and moving, making sure that he kept him defensive. So Phil Davis was defensive by staying on the back foot, as well as when he did utilize his wrestling, he stuffed some of the takedowns, which then detoured Phil Davis from shooting more. If Anglitskis can stop two or three takedowns, I think that you can start to detour Phil Davis from utilizing his wrestling. Big John and I always get on Phil about not utilizing his wrestling. So if you stuff one or two takedowns, he's like, this is why I don't use my wrestling. So if you're able to do that early, you may get Phil away from his wrestling. Did he listen to you this week? I wasn't there for the fighter meetings in person. You guys were there, and I was listening, and all you were doing was just waiting. Uh, you, you're going to use your wrestling there, Phil? Well, it's funny. He chose to listen to us against Olympic silver medalists, and he had success. I don't understand why he doesn't listen to us for other things, <laughs> but hey. Look, fighters go into their into their camps with the game plan and in their mindset, and they've got to switch it on when they have to. And this is him. It's, it's going to be a great fight either way. These guys are both incredible. Moro will send it back down to you to continue with the prelims. Yes, the prelims a roll on with action in the bantamweight division. Jordan Howard looking to move to two and two inside the Bellator MMA cage. He takes on Trevor Ward fighting for the first time in Bellator MMA. And now we welcome to the cage Trevor Ward. What a welcome for Trevor Ward, the 31 year old who is fighting out of Reno, Nevada. Played college soccer for Robert Morris University in Springfield, Illinois, but is trying to make the most of an opportunity here in Bellator MMA, and he's trying to bounce back 
From his fifth setback, he was submitted via guillotine choke against Ryan McDonald. And uh, that was a, a few sleeps ago, John. Just September 2018. Just a couple, yeah. But look, this is a guy at 135 pounds, Mom. Look at the length on this guy. He's got that lanky body, very long, very difficult to get into. That's what you're going to be seeing Jordan Howard trying to do, though. Tall, long, and lanky. Where, where have I heard that before? <laughs> And now, making his way, Jordan Howard. The march of March birthdays on Peloton 276 continues. Jordan Howard, he turned 32 yesterday. He is 10 and 5, and again fighting for the full fourth time here in Bellator MMA. Riding out of St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, he also has had a long layoff. In fact, the longest of his career. He's trying to snap a two-fight losing streak. His last fight coming at Bellator 197 in April of 2018. We have ring rust in boxing. Could we see a case of cage corrosion tonight? Ooh, look at that. All right, John, as you continue to marvel at the uh, alliteration take us through the tail of the tape very simple then uh, like i was talking about bantamweight 135 six foot one jordan howard at five nine is fairly tall at six one that's crazy tall we'll see if it has any effect on the fight all right tall dark and handsome michael c williams for those joining us tonight live across the UK on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you to the great state of Missouri as we get set now here at the Bellator 276 prelims for three five-minute rounds in the bantamweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot one, weighing in 136 pounds even. His professional record six and five. He fights out of Reno, Nevada, Trevor. Across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 135.8 pounds as a professional. Ten victories, five defeats out of St. Louis, Missouri, Jordan Howard. In charge once again, your referee, Zach Tybris. All right, somehow, some way. Reno, Nevada has morphed into St. Charles, Missouri because we have Jordan <laughs> Howard from St. Louis, but Trevor Ward is fighting out of Reno, and there are a lot of Wardiacs in the, in the house tonight as we get things started here in the 135-pound division. And, of course, John, we are all super excited to head back to Hawaii April 22nd and 23rd. It'll include the start of the much-anticipated $1 million Bantamweight World Grand Prix. Unbelievable fights coming on that with the champion, Sergio Pettis, taking on teammate Rafion Stotts. I cannot wait. And we saw Rafion Stotts begin to shine on the Bellator MMA prelims, and that's where Howard and Ward have an opportunity now to do the same. And you know, they're both coming off setbacks. And, John, the mentality, always an important part of MMA preparation. But a lot of pressure knowing here you are again for Ward under the bright Bellator MMA lights for the first time. And for Howard, hey, he needs to get off the schneid. Yeah, he has to get off the schneid, but you got to look at Howard. He came in as a, as a professional fighter. He had three losses in his first four fights, but then he rolled off nine straight wins. This guy can fight, and he can fight at range. He's got a southpaw stance that he uses very well. He blades himself well and he's got a good ground game so this is going to be how does Trevor Ward figure out how to attack Jordan Howard and as a fight fan you have to appreciate when Howard tells us expect a highlight real KO Trevor Ward may have something to say about that that was a nice inside leg kick by Trevor Ward set that up well landed clean a minute and a half gone in this bantamweight contest and Ward at 31 he's been around the sport of MMA for a long long time loves competing in the brotherhood of being in the gym and he's hoping to celebrate a win with 
cheeseburgers with no onions, John. Well, Warren has obviously been watching a lot of Howard's fights because you can see that he, look at how he's lowering his stance and keeping himself low because he knows that Howard's looking for that takedown somewhere in here and he's trying to get himself in a position where he can defend against him. Moore just missed with that overhand right going to the body with the long distance jab. Ward does have the slight reach advantage over Howard. Midway point of the first frame as Howard resets in the center of the cage. Trying to put the pressure on Ward. Nice stiff jab by Howard. that jabs look at him he's trying to set it up he slips inside and as soon as he's throwing it he's taking himself bringing himself off center so Ward doesn't have the chance to counter off him. both of them are proven finishers eight of Howard's ten wins have come inside the distance four knockouts four submissions and Ward five of his six victories come inside the distance with two KOs and three submissions. A minute 15 left here in the opening round. Ward attacking the lower extremities of the Southpaw Howard, attacking that lead leg. Ward's been doing a nice job of keeping this fight long. He's using those kicks to the legs. He brings them up high every now and then, but he's trying to keep this fight long, and right now he's able to. Under a minute remaining front kick by Ward. Howard fainting. Unable to mount an offense as Ward continues to be first to initiate the attack. Howard coming back with a one-two that well, effective in the technique didn't land the way he would have liked. Under 30 seconds left in the opening round and Ward looking to be devil. Howard mixing up his stances and of course in MMA we're seeing it more and more. Good takedown defense. Howard stuffing the takedown attempt of Ward. And telling him to get up. He's... Looking for the axe kick there. You want to mouth case out or are you going to keep it? All things yeah. considered, not a bad Feeling good first now? round, especially for two fighters coming off a long layoff. Actually, you know, you look at it and they both actually fought very composed, and that's something that tends to go away when we've had those long layoffs. We want to get in there and want to be super effective in the beginning. I thought they did a great job taking their time. Get that punch count up. More head movement. You're doing good. Their hands are doing just a little bit more, more punches before your kicks. Hey, you're flowing, baby. Deep breath. See? Deep breath. Remember, angle, keep angling. Keep angling. Yep, just go to your left. Every time he steps in, step to your left. Right. Both corners being happy with what they're seeing from their fighters. All right, Jamie, let's fight. Bell round at number two. Big John McCarthy has the unofficial scorecard. Who did you give the first round to and why, sir? Well, unofficially, I would give to, to Ward because he was the one landing those leg kicks. I thought that was the big difference. Yeah, Howard got him down at the end of the round, but didn't really do much. I think I would go with Ward. Speaking of kicks, Howard goes for the high head kick blocked by Ward. Ward unfurls a right hand. And he goes upstairs with a kick, also blocked. Ward's gonna have to start using his hands to set those kicks up, though. Right now, he's throwing a lot of naked kicks out there. You're gonna see Howard start to time those and landing counters.
Howard moving forward. Southpaw stance. Ward squared up, looking for the takedown. Again, neutralized by Howard, but the tenacious Ward looking to try to secure the single. But meanwhile, Howard unloading with his left. And now going for the net. So it ends up with Howard in dominant position. Yeah, at that point, Ward, you're holding on to that leg too long. When you realize you do not have that takedown, start to move your hands to get yourself at least to a position where you can start to get yourself back to your feet so you don't end up underneath him like he is right now. Crossface employed by Howard, trying to keep Ward pinned and trying to maximize his offense from the half guard, the open half guard of Ward. Ward looking to use the fence to his advantage. And so far, Howard just content to put the pressure, and there's a short forearm across the face of Howard, or make that Ward. <laughs> Howard is trying to just take and put pressure down. He wants to slide that elbow in. Right now, Ward needs to figure out he's got to start to move. He cannot stay in this half guard position. He's, he's got the fence right there to use to help him get back to his feet. He wants to control posture, not allow Howard to create that separation. More distance, more damage. But Ward is doing a good job of neutralizing Howard's attack midway point of the round and the fight. Right now, Ward is not showing any kind of ability to get Howard off of him or to change what's going on right now. Right now, he's basically just holding on, trying to keep himself from being damaged. And meanwhile, Howard trying to improve his position. There's another elbow strike across the face of Howard, or make that Ward, I keep wanting to. <laughs> it's Howard doing the damage. Howard is doing the damage, but Howard does need to start to separate a little bit. Look, he wants to keep this position close because that equals control. And he's able to control his opponent and keep the fight where he wants, but he needs to add a little bit more oomph, and so posture is gonna help him get a little more power. Like you see right there. More. Nastier shots, ground and pound from Jordan Howard. And the birthday gift comes in the form of his fifth victory via form of knockout turn 32 yesterday. And he just blew away Trevor Ward here tonight for his 11th victory. A very nice, composed win. And you talked about it tomorrow, you know, coming off of a long layoff. He was composed in that first round, and then in the second round, I thought Trevor Moore, Ward made another mistake in looking for that takedown. It didn't work well for him in the first round. It definitely didn't work well for him in the second, and Howard took advantage of it. Take a look at what happens here. Almost a desperation shot to get away from the stand-up, but then he holds on to the leg too long when he's lost the position. Right here, he has a chance. You see those elbows land by Howard, and there comes a point where Trevor Ward is now on his butt. There's no way for you to complete a takedown in that position. Let go with your hands and start to get yourself back to your feet. He didn't, and it cost him this fight because he was unable to, at that point, ever remove Jordan Howard from the top position. And once Jordan started to posture a little bit, gain a little space like we were talking about, the big elbows just ended this fight. The longest layoff of Jordan Howard's career ends with one of his biggest wins, and it snaps a two-fight losing streak as Howard improves to 11-5 and five with his fifth victory via form of knockout. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. Three minutes, 24 seconds, round number two by TKO. The winner, Jordan Howard. Let's go to Big John McCarthy. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it.
Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with your winner, Jordan Howard. Jordan, you had a long layoff between fights. You came back in this one. The first round, super impressed with your composure, taking your time, looking for your spots. But as each time that this fight hit the ground, that was your time to shine. So, um, yes, I had a quite, quite a long layoff. I had a shoulder surgery. I feel like I'm back to 100%. I fought three fights, basically one-handed. I feel like I'm back at 100%. Um, if I'm being honest, our game plan wasn't to be on the ground at all. Our game plan was to be on the feet, but we hit the ground. I felt very confident, very strong, so I went from there. He, he tried to take you down in the second round. It didn't work for him a second time, and then when you finally got that posture, you started to create a little bit more space, the big elbows... That was the end of the fight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you know, we, we're definitely trying to stay tight, kind of weather the storm once we hit the ground. And then once we started softening them up a little bit, I knew that there were going to be openings there. And so I decided to take a, a bigger risk, some chances. Well, you took a big risk. That was a beautiful fight, outstanding win. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jordan Howard. Now that's how you give yourself a birthday gift. The day after turning 32, Jordan Howard comes back from a career-long layoff to notch an impressive victory, improving to 2-2 two and two in the Bellator Bantamweight division. Let's go back to the fight desk. Here's Amanda Guerra. Moro, thank you so much. What a birthday present. These prelim fights have been absolutely incredible, and hopefully that is setting us up for an incredible main card coming up tonight. You see there, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Showtime. Uh, one fight I want to point out, because we, we can almost guarantee it's going to end in stunning fashion. John Salter versus Johnny Evelyn. Josh, let's break down this fight a little bit. I want to start with John Salter here because he's coming off a loss to gay guard Musasi. And you told us this week in the first minute, we're going to know if he has his confidence coming off a loss. Maybe a minute and a half. Okay. Give Hold me a little on. bit of slack. John knows how I like to change the rules as I go here. I, I have first <laughs> minute in my notes, but that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. No, I would agree, though. What happens is this game is built off confidence, especially fighting in combat sports. What we've got to see from him is, is he going to push forward? Is he going to try to get force those takedowns? Or is he going to stay back and wait for Johnny Evelyn to come to him? I really believe John, that Salter is the best fighter he can be when he walks people down, touches them with his striking, because he's got good striking. But he's got to just touch them with the striking to open up the takedowns. And when he gets on top, he's a finisher, like we've talked about. Yeah, what, what, uh, how many have gone to decision in his entire career? One? Uh, one. One. <laughs> we're we're double-checking ourselves. We'll double-check that. Uh, but let's talk about Johnny Evelyn, though. Look, he went pro 2017. He's been at Bellator MMA since 2019. He's undefeated still. You talked about him being a baby in this sport, but he is oh so good. Now, Salter says he's never faced someone like me before. What does Johnny Evelyn need to do to stay undefeated tonight? Well, John Salter is absolutely correct. He's never faced that. Johnny Evelyn's never faced someone like John Salter. John Salter's got all the experience. He's fought high-level competition. Johnny Evelyn is, like I said, a baby in this sport right now. He's dynamic. He's explosive. He is a good wrestler. And he's fallen in love with his power. And that right now sometimes scares me, though, because what happens is they chase after the knockout instead of utilizing all the tools. But in his last fight, we saw him use his wrestling. We saw him use some ground and pound. We saw him mix it up. That's what we wanted to see from someone like Johnny Evelyn. I'm telling you right now, this fight right now has the potential be the fight of the night. It's it's going to be incredible. We say that, though, because we're going through the whole card. Every fight has the potential yes. to be the fight of the night. Uh, we have a lot more pre prelim action coming your way after this. Hey, Bellator Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. The new Bellator MMA app is here. New look, new features, new fights. Watch live weigh-ins and prelims. Share your fight picks. Earn points and badges as you rank up to the heavyweight division. And stay up to date on events, rankings, and news. For all the latest features, download the new Bellator MMA app. Available on the App Store and Google Play. Bellator kicks into high gear. What a comeback! Ah! With two top-ranked featherweights vying for a guaranteed title shot. Oh! Flying knee knockout artist Adam Boric. And there's that knee! Faces a red-hot Mads Burnell. Fantastic finish by Burnell. Lux. Former champ Bill Davis makes his return. Take the room at the Saudi drop. Against the heavy fists of Julius Angliscus. Bellator MMA, tonight live on Showtime, where warriors rule. 
Family Arena, St. Charles, Missouri, with the Bellator 276 preliminary portion of the card, continuing with action in the welterweight division. Undefeated knockout artist Roman Feraldo looking to roll out the not-so-welcome mat to Calvin Rayford. And now to make his way to the cage, Calvin, next level, Rayford. 36-year-old Rayford brings a 5-3 and three professional record to his first fight under the bright lights of Bellator MMA. And at 36, it's now or never for a guy like Rayford, John, who is looking to derail the, the knockout express that is Roman Feraldo. That is exactly what he's looking to do. Look at Kelvin is a very good athlete. He's fast. He is got skills. The real question is, can he stay with the technical prowess and the way that Roman Feraldo attacks, and especially attacks with what you love, the flying knees, because this is a guy that can call his shot and make it. Coming off a loss to Chris Brown in April of last year, but all five of his victories have not required the judges' services. Three knockouts and a two submission wins. And now ready to make his way to the cage, vicious Roman Geraldo. Did I hear someone say vicious? Hey, you did. Roman Feraldo, 6-0 and oh as a pro. All six wins via form of knockout, including some of the flashiest flying knee strikes you will ever see, Big John. Look, this guy can just, he just downright can fight, man. This guy, look at that flying knee right there. That was against Pat Casey. That was when we were first introduced to Roma Feraldo and how dynamic he'd be. Then this one, watch him call this. He calls his shot after her turn twist. That is a huge knee. This guy is dynamic. He is fun to watch, and he comes to finish his opponents. One of three fighters in Bellator MMA history to earn multiple KO stemming from a flying knee, Michael Venom Page and Adam the Kid Boric being the other two. Boric will try to take to the skies later tonight in our feature attraction, the main event, five rounds. Very important featherweight fight against Mads Burnell, both number two looking to become number one, and Rayford looking to become the first fighter to defeat Feraldo. Now you can see a difference in age of 28 to 36, but as far as experience, just about the same. Here's Michael C. Williams. Tonight's Bellator 276 prelims continue now as we go to the welterweight division set for three five-minute rounds introducing the blue corner at six foot three weighing in 171 pounds his professional record five wins three losses out of Ada Oklahoma Kelvin next level Rayford. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot one, weighing in the same 171 pounds even as a professional. He's undefeated, six victories, no losses. The fighting pride of Key West, Florida, vicious Roman Barraldo. And the referee in charge, Mike England. Right over here, buddy, right there, right there. Stay right there, stay right there. Stay right there. Great fighter, great fighter, let's fight. Go. Bell round number one, Roman Feraldo fighting out of American top team in Coconut Creek, Florida. Kelvin Rayford representing Conquer BJJ. His head trainer, Bellator veteran Cortez Coleman. Look, Cortez Coleman had one, just a couple of great fights that I was able to referee. He is a good coach. He understands this sport. That's a good person to have in your corner. And speaking of great people to have in your corner, former WEC champion Mike Brown becoming one of the best minds in all of coaching. No doubt. Oh,
I am so disappointed there was no knee. <laughs> <laughs> This kid is special. He's got power in his hands, power in his kicks, powers in his knees. He is just a dynamic fighter, man, and he is on a roll. We are gonna be seeing a ton of Roman Feraldo. Let's take a look at this. You're gonna see what occurs. That jab right there, that stuns Kelvin. Puts him on his butt. You can see his arms going back, so he doesn't have the ability to even control his body that time. That's how stunned he was. See how his arm flops? That's telling you he is hurt. Ferrado then just looks at him, comes over, hammer fist, starts big time ground and pound. Kelvin did not have a chance at that point. Too hurt to defend himself correctly. Too much power on Ferraldo's shots. Take a look at you. Take a look at how fast. Watch this jab. Oh. He is seriously hurt right there. And he just comes in, and as we said at the start, he is a finisher. Heavy face. American top teams corner. Mike Brown is coach on the right. Watching as Feraldo puts the finishing touches on another brutal victory. To do anyway. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end. Officially 44 seconds round. Number one, the winner by TKO, still undefeated, vicious, Roman Ferraldo. Roman Feraldo just microwaved Kelvin Rayford. Gone in 44 seconds. Let's go to Big John McCarthy. All right, I'm here with Roman Feraldo. Roman, you have been on fire in this cage. You have annihilated every opponent that has stepped in here with you. You have finished every one of your fights by knockout. That, that was a jab that put him back, and you could see how hurt he was by where his arms went. And you saw it because you pointed at it again. Yeah, man, um, two things. One, a lot of hard work, a lot of discipline. I got the best guys in the world backing me. And uh, honestly, God-given ability to put people to sleep, bro. You can see it. Oh, you definitely have a God-given ability to put people to sleep. Let's talk about what should be next for you because you come in here and you have, like I said, you have lit everyone on fire. Who should you be coming into this cage next against? You know, <laughs> I was talking to Abe, man. He should, he's telling me I should call an MVP. <laughs> so, you know, my man, uh, Yaroslav's over in Ukraine. Shout out to him, man. He's a true warrior, true champ. You know, he's fighting for his country right now. That belt is uh, up for grabs, man. MVP, let's get it. Sounds good to me. I'd love to see it. Congratulations on another big win. Ladies and gentlemen, Give it up for Roman Feraldo. Hey, real quick, shout out to all my people from Key, uh, home, Key West. I love you guys, all my sponsors. Max and Baby, I love you. This is for you. I can't wait to see you guys. Thank you, everyone. Now, that's the kind of TKO that will most likely turn into an NF TKO. Roman Feraldo closes the show as he improves to 7-0 and with seven knockouts. Another savage representing American top team. Bellator 276 prelims continue right after uh, Mike Brown seizes the opportunity. Bellator fans head to bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. Tonight's
tonight's main event features two men, both ranked number two, both impatiently waiting for their chance to challenge for Bellator's 145 pound spotlight. Adam the Kid Borich enters the cage with an impressive 17 and one record, featuring an array of finishes that showcase his well-rounded skill set. And while his nickname may be the Kid, the Hungarian fighter has shown he has what it takes to be the man. He is not ready for me. I know I will finish him, and he, he already know it. His opponent, Mads Burnell, a Danish fighter who currently rides a seven-fight win streak and has quickly climbed the rankings since joining the promotion in 2020 and is ready to prove he belongs amongst the division's elite. To be the best, you got to beat the best. My mission is, of course, gold. I want that gold belt around my waist. Nothing more, nothing less. The deep and dangerous Bellator featherweight division is on full display in tonight's main event. Boards versus Burnell. It's great. I don't care who I fight. I'm gonna get it if you want it. I'm gonna kick your ass just to say I did it. You know, that's the McKee motto right there. It's time to find out who the next title challenger will be. And welcome back here to St. Charles, Missouri. Amanda Garrett, Josh Thompson with you here on the Fight Desk for Bellator 276. We're going to get back to the prelims in a second. Uh, we got to talk about the main event because I'm thinking of tonight like chapter two where it's a footnote. We had McKee Pitbull the first time around. We're going to get it again in a month. But whoever wins tonight will be the number one contender and will earn themselves a shot at that title next. Walk us through Adam Borich versus Mads Burnell. So Adam Borich, like I've said, countless times he's tall he's long he's lanky he needs to utilize his reach and his range all of those things but what I haven't talked a lot about is that his takedown defense is some of the best in the game he is a phenomenal fighter all the way around so he there's there's a threat there even though he has one loss okay in terms of a submission there's a threat there that, for, from him on the ground from the top position and even off of his back he's good at getting back up he is a finisher that's what he likes to do he will chase those finishes flying knees submissions jumping to the back he can do it all he has been a different fighter since that loss but he every fight he is showing his confidence in getting back on track he's gonna need that though tonight against Maz Burnell and that's the biggest thing Maz Burnell right now is riding that that win streak and he's running this thing realizing like I'm one fight away and he doesn't get the respect he deserves people overlook him I don't know why I don't, it just baffles me Big John and I talk about it all the time his striking's phenomenal but when he gets on top and he gets to that top position in submissions and threats he forces people to go the way that he wants them to and when he can do that he is a dangerous dangerous fighter Mads Burnell told us this week that he thinks his biggest advantage tonight is his fighting IQ we'll see if that plays out in the cage for now we'll send it back down oh my god I mean what a great prelim we've had so far Moro back down to you yes and with the featherweight division taking center stage in the main event we've got 145ers going to battle here in this preliminary bout between the undefeated Cody Law and the Bellator MMA debuting James Atcock. And now to make his way to the cage, James Atcock. Thirty-three-year-old James Adcock brings a seven and four record as a pro to the Bellator MMA cage. All seven wins have been finishes, and in fact, uh, John his previous eight fights, win or lose, they haven't gone past round one. Oh, look at this guy gets submissions, and he is a good fighter. The fight hits the ground. He is going after you. He is looking for that submission to end the fight. He does not want to sit there and allow you to control him. He is a good fighter. He does sometimes make mistakes based upon all that movement. He'll get a little too deep on something, give up too much, have a bad position, have to work his way out. He's gonna have to be very careful with the wrestling of Cody Law, but this should be a very interesting matchup. And he's higher than Snoop Dogg's recording studio, coming off a first round knockout win over Cody Shelton at four minutes, 20 seconds. Now you see why. <laughs> And now set to make his way, Cody Law. Hey, so far he has been the law. Mr. Former Lawman, Big John McCarthy, Cody Law has 
Five and zero, oh, three knockouts, one submission. And stop me if you've heard this before. Cody Long celebrating a birthday in March. <laughs> Turns 27, March 24th. So lots of birthdays up and down Bellator 276. But you know what? So far in his career, every day has been a pretty good day for Cody Long. You know, when Cody Long got into MMA, Dan Lambert came to me and said, John, watch this kid. He's going to be something special. He's one of my best at ATT. When you can say that about a young guy that doesn't have any professional fights, that's saying that you are impressed with what you're seeing in the gym. And we have seen it in the cage. Co Cody Long can do it all. This guy can wrestle. He can box. Take a look at what he does here. Big power. Puts, it, puts his opponents down, and when he does, man, he opens up and goes after him. He does not like to sit there. Big, crushing elbows. And every fight that he's had, he has been the guy that is in control. He dictates where the fight's gonna be. He dictates how it's gonna end. Speaking of Dan Lambert, he can cut quite a pro wrestling promo. And speaking of pro wrestling, big Bellator MMA fan, Big E suffered a broken neck in a match last night. Want to send a special shout out. He's already texting me. I know he's watching tonight, John. Let's go to the tail of the tape. Well, you know that he loves the record of Cody Law. 5-0 and against 7-4. and four. Also, look at the age difference. 26 to 33. Cody Law is one of those guys that I always say, that's the future. The future is now with Michael C. Williams. Tonight here in St. Charles, we'll go to three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner first at five foot nine, weighing in 145.4 pounds. His professional record, seven wins, four losses out of Knoxville, Tennessee. Introducing James Edgar. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145.6 pounds. The undefeated professional brings five wins without a defeat by way of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He fights out of Coconut Creek, Florida, presenting Cody Law. In charge, your referee, Mike England. Cody Law was an NC2A right Division right II right National right Wrestling right Champion. Adcock a BJJ Brown belt, and now they get things started. Opening round scheduled for three in the highly competitive featherweight division. Arguably one of the deepest in Bellator MMA. The, the Bantamweights might have something to say about that. Of course, their World Grand Prix beginning in Hawaii next month. But, John, what do you look for early here? Yeah, well, normally I see Adcock. He likes to come out. He likes to set the pace. He comes out and he tries to put it on you early. We're going to see if he does that with Cody Law or if he tries to take a little bit more time, get a feel for being out there under the brick, big lights right now. Law already switching stances back to orthodox, measuring the distance. Fainting. Cody Law just missing with that right hand, just grazed the chin. James Adcock. Adcock needs to be careful when he's dropping that. Nice body right kick hand. by uh, Law, but a good right hand by Adcock, and then he gets uh, stacked and he gets again. flipped again. And now Cody Law lighting up Adcock. Head kick. Punch away. himself because man what a night it was here he is now six and oh with his fourth ko john just a beautiful display of violence yeah, it was a beautiful display of taking your time because he hurt this is where people talk about knockouts this was a multitude of shots that landed watch what occurs in here you're going to see that when cody law starts to land these shots they start to just add up that's nothing right there, but watch that shot right there. That hurts Adcock. And he tries to get up and he starts to battle instead of gaining space or grabbing a hold. He's starting to bite down on that mouthpiece. That's not a good thing. Another shot that lands, gets himself back up, and that one puts him to sleep. 
Watch this big shot at the end. You see him pop back up from this, but not enough to protect his chin. That right hand just landed clean, and he is out. Cody Law sending James Adcock to La La Land. Good to see Adcock on the stool. About to enter his physical prime. Not there yet again. We mentioned Cody Law turning 27 later this month. Always appreciate the sign of sportsmanship between the fighters in the respective camps. So far for Mike Brown, it's been a picture perfect night. No filter required. American top team. One of the top camps in the sport and day. It's youngster Cody Law. One of the reasons why. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end. One minute, 17 seconds into round number one. The winner by knockout, still undefeated, Cody. Let's go to Big John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with Cody Law, getting rid of that mouthpiece. I'm looking at all these shirts. I see Mike Brown wearing this shirt. I see you. It says 5-0 oh on the back. That's wrong. That is absolutely wrong because that was a magnificent knockout. It was the composure that you had because you hit him with shots. It wasn't just one. It was a multitude that just added up till finally he went out. Talk to me about how you felt in that fight. I felt good, you know, again, kind of a little wild. Maybe I could slow it down a little bit more, but I landed some things we've been working on, the right high kick and short distance right hands. I was going to talk about that right high kick because in the middle of that exchange, you decided I'm coming up with the kick. Is that something you've been practicing because you want to bring that into your toolbox? Yeah, I wanted to put him away with the right high kick. I've been working on it with Artem, throwing the right hand, blended it behind the right high kick. Um, it hurt him, but I didn't put him away. I got to kick through a little bit more. I'll tell you what, it was an outstanding victory. Who is it that you want in this cage? You're now just putting guys away every time, looking better and better. Who is it that you think you should face next? Whoever's ready to fight soon. I'm ready to fight soon. How soon? We'll see, maybe a month or two, maybe uh, late May, early June. I look forward to it. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for Cody Law. The Artem that Cody Law mentioned, none other than kickboxing great Artem Levin, one of the striking coaches at American Top Team. Had the pleasure of uh, chronicling a big part of his kickboxing career. And hey, we're all excited to chronicle Cody Law's MMA career. He is now in second place at 6-0, the second longest active winning streak in the featherweight division behind only the top dog, A.J. McKee, who is, of course, 18 and 0. All 18 wins coming inside the Bellator MMA cage. So, guys, Amanda, Josh, man, Cody Law closing the uh, show in impressive fashion. Yeah, absolutely, Moro. Josh and I were just talking about him uh, when he was there in the cage with Big Josh. So he said he wanted to fight soon. Okay, so he went pro with Bellator October 29th, 2020. This was his sixth fight in that time span. He is undefeated still, and you think, look, Cody Law ready for the next step. Yeah, there's a couple of fighters that we've had on the prelims, and I feel like we need to send a petition to get them on the main card. Shout out Roman Feraldo. Roman Feraldo, there you go. And he's one fighter as well as Cody Law. They've been making gains, and they've been getting better and better every single time we see him in the cage. And we were talking about who would you like next. I want to see him probably break into that top 15, top 10, if you're looking in there. Maybe someone like a Daniel Weichel. That might be a good fight for him. You know, Daniel Weichel's got a lot of experience. Daniel Weichel's getting a little bit older as well. A great fight and matchup. The style in which he's coming along, he comes from a wrestling background. His top position is incredible in terms of his strength and where he moves his body in his wrestling but what i saw tonight from him was textbook stand-up he did rush it a little bit in some moments but that when he rocked him the first time with the shot he actually stepped to the right cut the corner and then landed that next shot beautifully done nice work that's the kind of gains you want to see from your young talent and he knew immediately what 
you know, that he needed to slow down a little bit. He said that to Big John. Uh, shout out Cody Law. Hopefully we'll see him on the main card sooner rather than later. Speaking of the main card, uh, let's take a, take a look at what we have coming up tonight on Showtime. Uh, I want to go to the bottom right now. J.J. Wilson, Godzi Rabaninov. J.J. Wilson is undefeated. We haven't seen him in about a year, Josh. And we're going to talk about Godzi here in a second because he is incredible. When it comes to J.J., he's now at lightweight. He's feeling better. What could we see from him tonight? He's feeling better because he can eat. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's that's a, and that's what he said. I can eat a normal meal, meal now and I feel good. Yeah, he was killing himself to get to 145 and three quarters of the time he wasn't making it. So it's like you've got to make a change. Either you get a nutritionist to live with you and take care of you or you go up a weight class. And he decided to go up a weight class, which is good work for him because you know you're going to see a good and a, a hard fought fight from him. He won't lose energy as the fight goes on. But at 145, he was so big. And you can see when he fought Pedro Caballo, he got on top and he just dominated. The big shots that dropped him, set him down, and he got to that top position. He is big for the 145 pound weight class. Now he's going to 55. He's still pretty big for this weight class as well. And he will mature as he gets a little bit more experience. As well. Okay, but how does he face up against Gazi? What are we going to see from Gazi? What it's is going to be a tough fight for him? Yeah, it's going to be a really tough fight for him. Gazi is phenomenal. He's got big power in his hands, like we saw last fight, as well as his wrestling is second to none. I've trained with him. I've been in the wrestling room with him. I've been on the mats with him. He is phenomenal everywhere. Not just setting up the power in his hands, but he can wrestle the Dickens out of you. I mean, he'll strike it. He'll strike <laughs> and close that distance. He's not as tall. He's not as long as JJ. But when he gets in deep, you are going for a ride. As I like to say, it's first class Dagestan Airlines, baby. He's taking you for a ride. What was it? The Dickens? Yeah, that's what the Dickens out of you. <laughs> you are showing your age, Josh Thompson. Uh, we will have more prelim action coming your way next. Head to bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. Bellator kicks into high gear. What a comeback! Ah! With two top-ranked featherweights vying for a guaranteed title shot. Oh! Flying knee knockout artist Adam Boric. And there's that knee! Faces a red-hot Mads Burnell. Fantastic finish by Burnell. Lux, former champ Bill Davis makes his return. Take the pool at the Saudi drop. Against the heavy fists of Julius Angliscus. Bellator MMA. Tonight, live on Showtime, where warriors rule. Looking forward to the main card and looking forward to more preliminary card action here at Bellator 276. And the women will be taking to the cage the undefeated Diana of Saragova. Takes on Bellator MMA's. Debuting Kiara Batara. She is eight and four as a pro. And now set to make her way to the cage, Kiara Makwai Batara. 27 years of age, diminutive dynamo, just 4'11", but what a firecracker, John, both in terms of what she brings to the cage and her personality, and, you know, usually the pun is always intended with me, but not this time. Taking the fight <laughs> on short notice, just the facts, John. Just the facts. Look, this this lady can wrestle. She is a good wrestler, and sometimes, you know, you take a look at that height, and you say 4'11", it actually helps her, man. She, it actually, she uses it to her advantage in getting low and coming into her opponent. She's got good stand-up. She is a tenacious fighter who just keeps coming after her opponent. She's fun to watch, but she's facing another person who can really wrestle. So it's going to be the question of whose wrestling is better on the night. Batara brings a three-fight winning streak to her first fight in the Bellator MMA cage. Two of those wins via armbar. All three of her submission wins have come courtesy of the armbar. Fighting out of Las Vegas, trains out of her house with her brother and her dad. 
So it is a family affair for the Bataras. Her brother, actually her main training partner. And now to make her way to the cage behind the Pantera of Saragova. Well, Diana of Saragova definitely knew how to make a first impression here in Bellator MMA as she took care of Tara Graf in 29 seconds, starching Graf with a flurry of punches, but was in tough against Gabriella Golfin at Bellator 262 last July, eked out a split decision victory to remain unbeaten 4-0, including two wins here in Bellator. Yeah, I don't believe that it should have been a split decision. I remember the fight well, but I did not think that Diana fought a smart fight. Diana is a very good wrestler, and in that fight, she made it a stand-up fight. She wrestled zero throughout this fight, which made it closer than it could have been. Her strength is her wrestling, and, and she got a big knockout in her first Bellator win. I think she fell in love with it. She tried for another one. It didn't work. Hopefully, she'll get back to her basics in this fight. Action in the flyweight division. Here comes Big John with the tail of the tape. Very slippery foot, you know, five foot seven to four eleven. There is a big height discrepancy. We'll see if that makes a difference. Here's Michael C. Williams. Rollo's joining us tonight live on YouTube, streaming at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports. We welcome you here to the family arena. The prelims roll on as we go to the flyweight division set for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at four foot eleven, weighing in 124.6 pounds. Her professional record: eight wins, four losses. Presenting Kiera Maguire Batara. And across the cage, her adversary out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 125.8 pounds. As a professional, she's undefeated. Four victories, no defeats. Introducing Diana Pantera Absalatova. In charge, your referee, Kerry Hatley. Afsar Algovab looking to uh, exchange strikes with Kiara Batara right, taking the fight work for you. Ready? Ready? on work. late notice. Batara looking to make the most of this opportunity. The bell, round one, they touch gloves and imme immediately Batara barreling forward gets dropped. But bounces right back up to her feet. Well, this is what we expect out of Kira. She comes, she comes hard. That's what I, every time I watch her fight, super aggressive. Normally, when she gets inside there, she's trying to get her hands around her opponent and get him to the ground. So, Afsanagova is getting the striking exchange she wanted. She's actually a master of sports and freestyle wrestling, and it's Batara initiating the wrestling. Batara had that. They had the overhook that was keeping her locked into a Saragova. We'll see if she can make this takedown work. And Batara spending a lot of energy trying to take up Saragova off her feet. Of Saragova looking to create separation and does so, but Batara again just. Coming forward, John. She's rough, man. She will take a shot to try to get inside. Like I said, that four foot eleven. A lot of people look at that and they go, "Oh my God!" It actually, in some ways, it helps her when she's changing levels for that shot. But right now, she's kind of raw dogging it because her shot, as far as her hands, she's throwing shots and she's too far outside for Diana to have to worry about them as they're coming. Diana Saragova is ranked at number nine, the champion. Juliana Velasquez undefeated at 12 and 0. Plenty of fantastic fighters in flyweight. Looking forward to the return of former champion Alima Le McFarland in her native Hawaii. Coming up next month as Batara goes with a jab and again just comes forward and pins of Saragova to the fence momentarily as the battle for position on. Folds here and of Saragova doing a good job with the takedown defense. Yeah, she's doing a nice job. She gets that underhook. She's trying to limp arm out of that. Didn't work for her because Kira just aggressive and 
getting down, changing the levels, but she's having a hard time holding on to Diana. Batara telling us that she was going to set the pace and she felt that Afsanagova would not be ready for her pressure. Well, she's definitely bringing the pressure, but so far Afsanagova has done a, a great job of thwarting the attack of Batara as we are at the midpoint of the opening round. One of the things that Asarakova has really done, and you can tell it's the coaching of Artem Levin, take a look at her footwork. She's a lot more in and out, taking her time. And when you see Kira coming in to take that, you're seeing her circle instead of going straight back. Mo Law obviously helping with her wrestling technique too. Jane Mo, Bellator MMA competitor, former Strike Force champion, who has a again a keen mind. So many fighters who have amazing analytical minds. That's why they make fantastic analysts and fantastic coaches. No doubt about it. Look, Mo, Mo Law, Art of is, he is one of the smartest guys when it comes to breaking down an oh, opponent. Boys, 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 very, yeah. very sharp mind when it comes to the fight world. Can't say it enough. I always say it about Mo. And he doesn't get enough credit. Batara again just barreling her way forward and gets caught by Afsanagova. Less than a minute and a half remaining in the opening round. Batara saying that her greatest strength is that she is a scrapper, already proving to be that here in the first round of her Bellator MMA tenure, but gets countered by Afsanagova. Now, Sarkova has been, she's been able to land her counters and her striking is looking crisp. She's landing some good shots. Under a minute remaining here in the first round, as we mentioned, of Saragova's lone knockout came in her first fight for Pelotor MMA. Just 29 seconds as she attacks the lead leg of Batara. Nice, nice straight right hand by Saragova. And again, just sitting composed, balanced, delivering a nice textbook combination. And you're seeing the Kira is starting to slow down a little bit on that. The, the, the timing on her shots is starting to slow down as she's coming in. These shots. Oh, and she was looking for the superwoman punch, but the kryptonite comes in the form of this brutal barrage from the Saragoba, lighting up Batara. Batara was looking for that superwoman punch, and she almost crashed and burned. Will she survive the final five seconds of the round? Talk about a crisp counter, John. That way it went in. The, the, the worst part for Kira was she jumped into it, which only intensified the blow. She did a nice job of recovering from it, though. Yeah. Five times five. Four times four. And this look, this is Kira coming after, and that was a beautiful left hook over the top. A little bit at the end of the range, but you see her eat that shot, and it almost turns her around. And then as she comes forward, <laughs> that right hand's the one that put, Timing. Her, put her back against that cage, and she ate a lot more shots. And this is where, you know, she's trying to get into that grappling and hold on. She's just unable. Hands up. To get that hold right. on Sargova. But you know what? In many ways, Batara doing what you want from a, a late replacement, knowing that had no real time to prepare for her opponents, just bringing that scrappiness, bringing the pace, bringing the pressure, but. Diana Pantera of Saragova is a highly talented ready. prospect for a reason. Oh, absolutely. But you got to love what Kira's doing because she is coming to fight. Speaking of the fight, Big John McCarthy, unofficial scorecard reads what and why. Well, 10 9 of Saragova in that round. She landed the cleaner shots overall. She was able to control where the fight was at. She gets the round. Currently ranked number nine in the 125 pound weight class. Kira's starting to dip her head when she's coming towards Diana now. She needs to be careful of doing that. She can't take her eyes off of that target. Rotara looking for her fourth consecutive victory, by far facing the toughest opponent of her career. 
And again, Afsara Gova able to land those textbook one-two combinations because Patera is not coming off center line. She's coming straight down the middle. Yeah. And, and her chin up in the air. Patera can't come in exactly like you said. She's rushing in and she's eating that right hand over and over. Oh, and she just ate that right hand. But again, bites down and comes forward, but unable to stymie the counterattack of Afsara Gova. And yet here comes Batara. It's like Batara willingly enters the eye of the hurricane, John. Oh, she willingly enters the eye. She, she tends to stir it up a little bit, too. Oh, she went for a lateral on that. Did not have it. Saragova in a good position right now. She can take that arm for the arm bar. And her lone submission win has come via arm bar. Batara, there's blood on her face, and Batara now looking for a footlock, but nothing there. And did not have that. Afsara Galba back on her feet. Nice job by Kira to get herself back out of a bad position. She went for that lateral drop. It did not work. You saw Afsara Galba be able to stop it. Heavy hips dropped right down on her. But right away, Kira got herself back to her feet. And if Batara survives the second round, it'll be up to the corner to see if they can stop that bleeding. I believe it is at the hairline. It's hard to tell. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't tell, tell if it's sure. Coming up on the halfway point of the second round, the midway point of this flyweight fight. Matera swinging with all her might, but missing with the right hand. But this is the kind of fight, if you're the coaches of Diana Saragova, this is the kind of fight you want her to be in. Someone that does not back off of her, someone that goes after her and makes her fight. And of Saragova talked about the difficult weight cut in her last fight. Yeah. Did not feel at 100%. I don't know if any fighter ever enters the cage at 100%, but she remains at 100% in her career thus far, 4 and 0. Oh, and thus far, doing a great job of countering the bull rushing baton. Did a great job of landing the cleaner strikes, waiting for those rushes, countering and being very good with her defensive wrestling. And Batara leading with a right hand. There's a right hand that lands for Batara, but again, Saragova though, comes back and... Batara was able to land two right hands there, but Saragova's was the stronger one. Right. That's what backed her off. Coming up on the final minute of the second round of Saragova utilizing lateral footwork and awaiting Batara willingly enters the fray, trying to swing for the fences, trying to knock up Saragova off her game. If Saragova should, should get a read on what Kira is doing as far as when she's dropping her head, she does have the ability uppercut or bring the knee up the middle. Half minute left in the round. Inside late kick for Batara. Of Saragova. Walk her down, short steps. Goes to the bottom for the one, two, but Batara going upstairs. Combination the body for a Saragova. We are through two rounds. Third and final round of this flyweight fight. Coming up. Она намного больше сил потратила. Ну нужно чуть-чуть еще точных попаданий. Stay in the pocket and apply that right pressure. We saw she was when she was on the ground. Let's go. Right. 
The battling Bataras in one corner and uh, American top team helping out Diana of Saragova with King Mo and Artem Levin. Her corner. You can see Artem Levin there talking about that uppercut which she's coming in with her head down. She is destined to eat one if you throw it. St. Charles, Missouri Family Arena showing their appreciation for the efforts of both. But Tara taking the fight on short notice and the undefeated Diana of Saragova. Right, last round, ladies. Last Third round. and final Four. round. Last five minutes, put it on. <laughs> words you want to hear from a coach. You don't want to have anything left in the tank, especially these, with the way gas prices are these days, John, you might as well just run it till it's empty. Run it till it's dry. <laughs> oh, Batara, again, crashes in, crushes the spaces, we like to say, John, but not getting the desired dividends. No, she, she really needs to utilize a little bit different approach. You know, straight linear, you know, attacks, not usually what's going to work well for you. You got to create those angles that are going to put your opponent in a position where they're not sure exactly where it's coming from. I don't think that Diana has any doubt where Mary is coming from. Very patient under fire and yet still getting tagged at times, but Afsara Gova very cool under fire and doing a great job of defending the determined takedown attempts of Kira Matara. This is like I said, look, Afsara Gova is a very good wrestler. I was so impressed with watching her and some of her technique. She has been taught well. I know Kira, and Kira is a tenacious wrestler. She's been wrestling her whole life. She loves the sport, and she's good at it. So I figured that their wrestling was going to cancel each other out a little bit. Wasn't sure what was going to happen on the feet, but I, I'm really impressed with the way that Diana has been able to defensively stop every offensive attack in the wrestling portion. Of Saragova, just 23 years of age, controlling Batara here with just over three minutes left in the third round. See, in just that position you just saw right there, with, look at Batara is the one carrying the weight. Sorry, Go is not working hard. She's actually getting arrested in that position while Batara is actually having to breathe hard to hold that weight. Now's not the time to <laughs> have a lull in the action with just two and a half minutes left in the fight. Well, the, the, the real problem is Kira is in that position right now. She just doesn't know how to attack her. Everything that she's tried just really hasn't worked for her. And it's the, the real you know, difference is all those linear attacks. And again, taking the fight, you know, short notice. Uh, conditioning probably Absolutely. not the best, but she has given it the whole college try, as they say here, the 27-year-old Batara. Fighting out of Las Vegas with the opportunity here and with less than two minutes now remaining, we'll try to see if she can drum up some offensive success against uh, Diana of Saragova, who's been very, again, as we mentioned, composed, very tactical and, and successful. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you want to see her put the you, pedal to the metal. I would. That's the, that's the difference. I've seen everything. The composure is there. She's taking her time. And, you know, she's done a great job defensively. But now's the time when you see your opponent is, is starting to have problems. Start stepping on the gas. Start putting more pressure. Create that finish. Nice job of wanting to see her as she's circling out there. by of Saragova as of Saragova in the center of the cage. Pying at Batar with the jab. Batar, meanwhile, trying to 
fire off everything with bad intention. She's giving it everything she has. You can't ask for anything nope. more. I really, I, I appreciate the effort by Kira. Trying to make it a fight against Dovsanakova, doing a good job of neutralizing Batara, using the jab effectively here in the third round as Batara, though, closing the distance. Again, changing levels, a sprawl by Dovsanakova, who has shut down Batara's takedown attempts all fight long. All fight long. Nice job of trying to sit out through there. Kira almost getting the back. Just no time. Kira Batara gave it her all until the, the final bell. 15 minutes in this flyweight fight as Saragova and Batara embrace. How do you have it? And why, sir? Well, I, let's be honest. This should go to Diana. I want you Saragova. to always be honest, my friend. <laughs> it, but it's to me, it's... Yeah, she gets the win, but I, you got to be impressed with the effort of Kira and what she brought in a fight when she was a last-minute replacement. She fought her butt off. I really appreciate everything she did. And watching in real time, what are areas that you would like to see of Saragova continue her growth? And let's face it, there's nowhere to go but up because she's 23 years old. This is her fifth professional fight. I mean, there is so much growth there is to be done. But you, you can take a look at just simple things. When Diana is circling towards her left, she moves very well. When she's circling towards her right, it's not quite as clean, it's not quite as well done, and you see that Kira was able to get into her. So these are the things, it's just a matter of repetition, going back to practice, and just doing it over and over. And we await the official decision, but for Saragova again, not knowing her opponent well, the circumstances, you would have liked to have seen a little more aggression in that third round. Yeah, I, you know, that's the whole point. When you get that point where you've oh, worn your camp. opponent down, <laughs> and well, you have her in a position where close. she's second-guessing what to do, now it's your turn to say, okay, let me show you what's going to happen and make it happen. All right. Michael C. Williams standing by with the name of the winner. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. All three, Marcel Valera, Jaron Vallel, Robin Veal, have it the same at 30 to 27. Fourth winner by unanimous decision, the head of Pantelho of Sarhagova. Jan of Sarhagova, number nine ranked to flyweight, keeps her undefeated record intact. As she improves to 5 and 0 oh overall, 3 and 0 oh in Bellator MMA, a gutsy effort by the debuting Kira Batara. Let's go back to the fight desk in Amanda Gare. Maura, you stole the words out of my mouth. A gutsy performance by Kira there. Uh, she took the fight, which she found out Sunday, I think it was, but Diana comes out with a win yet again. Yeah, I mean, Batara came out aggressive, wasn't able to get the reach, wasn't able to get the takedowns. She's a phenomenal wrestler. Just wasn't her night. I mean, on a short notice fight like that, but she she showed a lot of g grit. That's what I want to see out I'm of these say young gutsy talent. Gutsy again, too. Gutsy like, grit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but if Sarah Gova looks phenomenal, I think she did everything she had to do. I would like to have seen her try to go for the finish a little bit more, but Batara's tough. She's she's gritty. She knew if she left herself out of position, the Batara would go ahead and attack. So I thought it was a great performance by both of It is. We have one more fight on the prelim card. Uh, we are gearing up for the main card. It's going to be absolutely incredible. We have two more fights. Excuse me. That is just how good this night has been. Um, I want to talk about what is coming up in a month from now because the main card tonight leads to what we are going to see in a month. April 15th in San Jose. Two title fights in one night and one of them a rematch. We can't wait to watch. The top dog is Patricio Pitbull, the champion, undefeated AJ McKee, who will be able to claim themselves the greatest featherweight. Oh my God! All those guys think they can beat me, but always they fall. Come, I'm ready for you. Don't take it personal, Pitbull, but I got a leash in a kennel waiting for you. The mercenary claims another victim. Let's go!
first one, it was just go in there, do your job, secure the belt. And now it's, I want to make sure he never wants to step in the cage with me again. It is going to be absolutely incredible. We are all going to be there April 15th in San Jose uh, to watch the rematch we all want to see between AJ McKee and Patricio Pitbull there. Let's bring in somebody who was at the first one, and he's going to be at the next one. We got Josh up here on the fight desk. Big John, I guess we're going to bring you in. Um, we found out last minute we're going to do this. We are so excited to talk to you. Big John, we'll start with you in this rematch. The first one was one of the, if not the most anticipated fights in Bellator history. What can we expect in the rematch? I think what you're going to see in the rematch is you're going to see AJ McKee trying to do the exact same thing that he did, and it's because it worked. You're going to see Patricio trying to get back to who he was, meaning that Patricio is a guy that he would go out and control the center of the cage and make his opponent come to him, make him fight the fight he wanted. AJ's not that guy. AJ's longer by eight inches in reach. He's faster, and Patricio's going to have to figure out something new that's going to work against AJ McKee. Patricio's been able to deal with length his whole career. The speed, though, was the biggest thing, John. You and I had talked about this for weeks leading up to this fight. Just constantly saying the speed. How is he going to deal with the speed? And the speed was the factor right off the bat with the head kick and then the combination. Now, the submission, I don't go too far into that, only based off of the fact because he was pretty rocked at that time and situation. But Patricio is also somebody in this game, John, you know, he fights at a high fight IQ level. He will make the required adjustment to make sure that this fight starts to go his way. I'm looking for this fight to get deep into the fight. No, I agree with you. I, if there's one thing about Patricio, and I know from being in the cage with him, look, he's a smart fighter, and he's going to go back and look, and he's going to see the things that happened that were very small, but they, they were the difference in the fight, and you're going to see him make those adjustments. The real question is, will those adjustments be the difference? I'm not sure that they will be. Well, John, his fight IQ has shown throughout his career, but remember when he was younger, he just fought like a pit bull, and then he started <laughs> making his adjustments as he he got smarter and he got more mature and it just started coming through his stance change hit the way he set up his shots his power all of those things his wrestling has gotten so much better working with Henry Cejudo Henry Cejudo said that he's like my style came for Patricio because he had started working with each other and they realized how good that he was and then I'm telling you right now I think he's gonna make the required adjustments to make their make sure that he tries to get his title back. he's got to do that and he's got to deal with the speed that's the real question yeah. That just goes to show we can talk about that fight all night again. That is going to be April 15th in San Jose. All three of us will be there. Let's talk about one of the fights we have coming up on the main card tonight, a battle of middleweights between Johnny Eblen and John Salter. Johnny Eblen coming into this big John still undefeated, but John Salter says, look, he's never faced a guy like me before. Big John, what can we see from Johnny Eblen tonight to try to keep that undefeated streak going? Well, I think John Salter is right. He has not ever faced anybody like John Salter, but he has faced faced good competition he's faced a variety guys that wrestled guys that were good in the stand-up and you can take a look that when Johnny goes after people he goes after him to finish he's got power you know he's gone through all these different nicknames and one of them was diamond hands now he's the human Chico but look at the power he has you're taking a professional fighter and make them turn into a schoolyard kid not knowing what to do Johnny Eblen can wrestle and he can fight on the feet he is a guy that John Salter is a phenomenal submission you know, specialist, but he's got to be in the top position. And can he do that with a wrestler like Johnny Eblen? I'm not sure he can. Yeah. My concern, though, John, with Johnny Eblen is the same thing that you and I have talked about forever. You've taken wrestlers that fall in love with their hands. We've seen it before in the past. Will he fall victim to that again tonight? Now, in terms of on the feet, he may overextend himself. He is still a young fighter. I know he's undefeated, but he hasn't fought anyone the level of John Salter. Now, I believe Eblen has all the tools to beat John Salter, from the wrestling to the striking to the explosiveness, the youth, all of those things obviously favor him. But can he capitalize in a moment like this? We've seen fighters before in the past sometimes wilt at the highest level of competition. This is a huge jump up for Johnny Eblen. No, it is. And the one thing he's got to be very careful with John Salter, John Salter takes the back in all kinds of different ways. He needs to be very careful of letting his back get taken by John. 
let's talk about John Salter a little bit more. And Josh, I want to start with you here because look, he's actually coming off a loss into this fight to Gegard Mousasi. And you said this week, we're going to know in about the first minute if he has his confidence going into this fight coming off that loss. Yeah, it's really going to come down to John. You and I have talked about this repeatedly is that he's he going to come forward. Is he going to push the pace? Is he going to really put Johnny Evelyn on his back foot and make him feel paranoid or not just paranoid, but make him feel uncomfortable in that cage? There's that black line that circles the cage up to the fence, right? You have the black line. If he can put Johnny Evelyn in that range to make it easier for him to get the takedowns and start pulling him away from the fence after he pushes him down, then you can start to look to him, watch him set up all of his all of his submissions. He's, he takes the back better than most fighters that I've ever seen, and he gets to, he works for the side chokes, he works for arm bars, he looks for every finish he possibly can. But can he put Johnny Evelyn on his back foot between between that black line and the cage? That's going to be the question, John. Absolutely right, because no one's been able to do it to this point. Can John Salter do it? We're going to find out. Big John, we appreciate it. We're gonna. Ah, don't to blow work. his head up anymore. <laughs> Calm down, guys. Run along, John. Back Look, to the cage. I, I, I love John more than anyone here. And John, don't let that go to your head, okay? We I had a little not. text exchange earlier this week. We'll talk about that after the show. Uh, again, that main card kicking off 8 Central, 9 Eastern on Showtime. More prelim action. We got two more. They've been incredible so far. Coming up after this. Hey, Bellator Nation. Follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. The new Bellator MMA app is here. New look, new features, new fights. Watch live weigh-ins and prelims Share your fight picks, earn points and badges as you rank up to the heavyweight division, and stay up to date on events, rankings, and news. For all the latest features, download the new Bellator MMA app, available on the App Store and Google Play. Bellator kicks into high gear. What a comeback! Ah! With two top-ranked featherweights vying for a guaranteed title shot. Ah! Flying knee knockout artist Adam Boric. And there's that knee! Faces a red hot Mads Burnell. Fantastic finish by Burnell. Lux, former champ Bill Davis makes his return. Take the room at the Saudi Rock. Against the heavy fists of Julius Angliscus. Bellator MMA. Tonight, live on Showtime, where warriors rule. I swear March must be spelled M-M-A-R-C-H. Another birthday boy this month. Romero Cotton turned 32 March 6th. He's 5-0 as a pro and in Bellator MMA. He takes on Bellator newcomer Freddie Sandoval in this 185-pound contest. Now, on his way to the cage, this is Freddie Sandoval. LL Cool J might say, don't call it a comeback, but after almost a dozen years, John, what Close. would you call it? I would call it a comeback. <laughs> it has been over a dozen years since Freddie Sandoval competed in mixed martial arts, and things didn't go well that night for him. Losing to Sadia Parker via TKO, but hey, never say no to a man's dreams and here he is at 35 but boy you talk about uh, the potential for a lamb being led to slaughter he faces a monster in Romero Cotton well he is facing a monster but he has faced good competition in the past he's got a knockout win against Drew Fickett oh. who is a guy that everyone you know, knows from what have known back before Drake uh, dominated a, the hello, charts. a ton of talent <laughs> You know, guy, he fought guys like Nick Diaz, all kinds of top talent. So he can fight. The question is, can he stay in with a monster like Romero Cotton? And now his opponent, Romero, Bad News Cotton. Nice welcome for Romero Cotton. He's fighting out of San Jose, California with AKA 
by way of Hutchinson, Kansas. Previous three wins have come in the opening round, as you see, was a three-time NCAA Division II national champion, University of Nebraska at Kearney. His five-fight Bellator winning streak at middleweight, third longest active streak in the division, behind Johnny Eblen, who we will see later tonight in the biggest fight of his life against John Salter, and Tokov's six fight win streak. Yeah, the big thing with Romero Cotton, look, there's no doubt about the skill. This guy's got it all. He's a great wrestler. He's got heavy hands. He is strong as a just unbelievable monster strength. The question is, can he stay healthy? Because he's had fights that have been canceled based upon getting ill, things that have happened. He just has had no luck. He's going to start that luck here tonight, possibly. So, a knockout. Well, a win tonight, and he will share first place with Johnny Eblen and Anatoly Tokov at six. But again, we will take a look at what makes Romero Cotton so good. Look, at this is him against Sumter, man. And like I said, Romero is just strong. He'll get a hold of that neck, and he will, he will actually pinch your head off. That's the kind of strength that he has. He is a guy that once he grabs a hold of something, you better know what you're doing or he's going to take it home. Here come the numbers for this middleweight matchup. Simply put, take a look at what you got here. 72 inch to a 69 inch reach. Romero's normally the wrestler, but he's been working on his hands and he says he's gonna use them here tonight. Here's Michael C. Williams. We thank all those that are still tuned in late night in the UK on BBC iPlayer here at Bellator 276. We'll move now to three five-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 185.2 pounds. His professional record eight and six with one draw, fighting out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, Freddy Sandoval. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 185.8 pounds. The undefeated professional stands at five and zero, oh, fighting out of San Jose, California, by way of Hutchinson, Kansas. Romero Madness Cotton. And the referee in charge, Jason Herzog. Cotton fights for his daughter, Aliyah. While Sandoval says his greatest strength Marcel, is ready? the ground game, but against uh, a guy who was the first ever three-time champion in the over 100-year history of Nebraska Kearney University in wrestling. Be careful what you wish for. Cotton ranked in number eight at 185 as that catapult left hand came from Sandoval. Gegard Musasi looked absolutely devastating in dispatching the previously undefeated Austin Vanderford in his latest title defense. But Romero Cotton still very much working on his game and trying to stave off those uh, ancient attacks of Sandoval. It's like those catapult fireballs. That was a nice attempt at a knee by Romero Cotton there, but you got to figure, again, we talk about ring rust or not being in the cage for a while. Romero has not been in the cage for a while here, Morrow, so it's going to take him a little bit of time, get himself settled down, and then do business. Remember the lesson earlier tonight? I did. MMA, cage corrosion. Cage Let's make corrosion. It Come on now. I like that. A minute gone here in the first round. Body kick by Cotton. And oh, and there you talk about timing, but it's Sandoval going for the submission. I almost thought he ran right into the knee of Cotton, but it turned out Sandoval knew exactly what he was doing, John. Almost an MNR roll there. Well, I don't know if he knew what he was well, doing. He, first. He, he, he made the knee. adjustment when it now. He went for the heel hook, but not a good thing to do when your opponent, you don't have control of your opponent's body. And this is where Romero yeah. Cotton is just a monster. He has to adjust yeah. to this yeah. offensive onslaught. Sandoval was shelling up, but not returning fire. And Romero Cotton, yeah, he is eating good tonight, feasting on Freddie Sandoval, improving to 6-0. and oh. 
as a pro, all six fights coming inside the Bellator MMA cage. This is where we talk about Romero Cotton and the strength and his ability to maintain that top position based upon his wrestling background. Take a look, he goes to land the knee, it does not hit, it hits the shoulder. And right away you see Sandoval go for the heel hook. He doesn't have it in place though. You have got to have control of your opponent's leg and he doesn't. It's not entwined the right way and that's why Romero is able to spin out of it. And once he does, he just starts opening up with that jackhammer. And there's just big shots. You see the tap by Sandoval. He actually tapped. He wanted out of there. Did not want any more of the strength and power of Romero Cotton. Big shots. Sandoval finding out in a painful way that Cotton is anything but soft in the Bellator MMA cage. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, the official time, one minute, 39 seconds, round number one, the winner by TKO Romero. Bad news, Cotton. Here's Big John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with Romero Cotton. Romero, you have had a hard time getting back in this cage. It's been a while. You had some illnesses and things happen. How did it feel finally being back in here? Oh um, man, we had, you know, we had some injuries last year. Caught the COVID, kept us out the last one. But uh, feels good to be back in here, man, and feel at home. You look like you were in the beginning, kind of just taking your time, backing away at times, just taking and slowing the fight down. And when you decided to explode. It was pretty awesome. Uh, you know, coach said to relax. You know, we was back in the back getting all amped up and stuff. He said, hey, calm down. Go out there, take your time. Circle around and uh, look for your shit. And that's what we did. When he, you went for the knee, it hit the shoulder. It didn't hit him in the head, but he went for that heel hook. You had this, like, smirk on your face, like, that ain't going to happen. And then you opened up with the ground and pound. Hey, man, I work with Yuri Simones and, and my coach, Ron Kessler, man. So it's like... I see that type of stuff every day, so I, I feel like it wasn't there wasn't nothing there, and so I, I knew I knew it wasn't going to happen. Well, I want to congratulate you on a big win. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Romero Cotton. Romero Cotton in high school won 10 state championships: four in wrestling, four in football, two in powerlifting, and now in MMA. Very well on his way to one day vying for a Bellator MMA title, improving to 6-0 and and getting it done in violent fashion against Freddie Sandoval. Let's go back to Amanda and Josh at the fight desk. Mara, we appreciate it. We had not seen Romero Cotton in the cage uh, since December of 2020. What a return tonight, Josh. Yeah, he's a phenomenal fighter. I've trained with him. I've actually held mitts for him and worked with him quite a bit over the last two years. Just injuries plagued him. I mean, then got the COVID, and it just was one of those things. He likes to say, I got the COVID. I got the COVID. Got a the lot COVID. of us got the COVID. But he's been he's been matched up against Dalton Rossa several times. I'd like to see that fight happen to come to fruition. I mean, they're both, I think they're seven and eight in the rankings. He's a phenomenal fighter. What people don't understand about him is that he's just not as active, but he's good on the ground. I mean, he see, you see him get out of this leg lock position. Never did he feel threatened, but he's phenomenal on the ground. His strength and his ability to hit submissions is really good when he's on that top position. He just chooses not to. He chooses to go for the finish when the ground and pound. He's got a ton of power. As you see, when he delivers that ground and pound, people just turtle up into the fetal position. They're like, get me out of here. Yeah, please, because yes, nobody please. wants to go against that. <laughs> um, you trained with him. You also trained with Mads Burnell, who is going to be in our main event tonight. So many implications in this main event. The main one is it is the biggest fight of their lives tonight. Mads Burnell, Adam Boric, because they want a shot at the title. Bellator's featherweight division has seen its share of classic comebacks. Never count Joe Ward out of a fight ever. Fantastic finishes. There's the top! He got the finish with less than a minute left. That's a championship performance. And magical moments. Oh my God! Another spectacular comeback! 
but none was bigger than the last time the belt changed hands. July 31st, 2021, Inglewood, California, a night that featured the final of the Million Dollar Featherweight World Grand Prix, a night that will go down as one of Bellator's most memorable. Two-division world champion Patricio Pitbull, the pound-for-pound -pound king, faced 17-0 phenom A.J. McKee in an eagerly awaited showdown. And what occurred in the first two minutes of round one shook the Bellator featherweight division and the MMA world to its core. With that stunning victory, McKee further cemented himself as a superstar and now reigns supreme over one of Bellator's deepest and toughest divisions. I think a lot of people were kind of in awe and like, damn, he did it. And he did it exactly how he said he was going to do it. I had a lot to prove, and I needed to welcome the world to who the mercenary was. Looking ahead to April 15th in San Jose, McKee and Pitbull will run it back in a highly anticipated rematch, leaving the door open for the rest of the division, a shark tank of 145ers, all looking to stake their claim to a shot at the belt. Tonight's main event features two men, both ranked number two, both impatiently waiting for their chance to challenge for Bellator's 145-pound spotlight. Adam the Kid Boric enters the cage with an impressive 17-1 record, featuring an array of finishes that showcase his well-rounded skill set. And while his nickname may be the Kid, the Hungarian fighter has shown he has what it takes to be the man. He's not ready for me. I know I will finish him, and he, he already know it. His opponent, Mads Burnell, a Danish fighter who currently rides a seven-fight win streak and has quickly climbed the rankings since joining the promotion in 2020 and is ready to prove he belongs amongst the division's elite. To be the best, you got to beat the best. My mission is, of course, gold. I want that gold belt around my waist. Nothing more, nothing less. The deep and dangerous Bellator featherweight division is on full display in tonight's main event. Boric versus Burnell. It's great. I don't care who I fight. Come get it if you want it. I'm going to kick your ass just to say I did it. You know, that's the McKee motto right there. It's time to find out who the next title challenger will be. And that brings us into our main event tonight. And Amora talked in that about just how deep and how talented this division is there. You see Matt Burnell, Adam Boric, Whoever comes out tonight will be the new number one contender. We can't wait to watch it unfold here. Let's start with Adam Boric, Josh, because he's on a three-fight win streak, so that's great. But that four fight, four fights ago, was a loss to Darian Caldwell. It shook his confidence. He told us that, and he said, fight by fight, I'm feeling a little bit better. But that can't even be in his head tonight. Yeah, and I don't think it's going to be in his head. When we were talking with him this week, he seemed very confident in terms of, like, I've got it out of the way. I feel better about where I'm at and my direction. Look, when you train at a gym, at a gym like Sanford MMA, which they're just stacked with top-level talent. They're one of the best gyms in the world. And just knowing that every day you go in there, it's a it's a fight. It's a fight for your life, whether it's wrestling, whether it's jujitsu, or whether it's kickboxing that day. He's fighting for his life in there. But he's... He, I think, has now found a rhythm back onto where he was. I just want to see if he can go out there when the bright lights turn on and get back to what we're seeing in this highlight package. I want to see if we're going to see the flying knees. I want to know if his confidence is enough to put his combinations together, from the striking to the kicking, and then even utilizing his wrestling. There's nothing against... There's no one out there has said that he can't wrestle. He can wrestle. And not only can he wrestle, he's got some submissions under his belt as well. Everyone I've talked to at Sanford MMA said he is the full package. He just needs to believe in himself, and I think he's back on track. And we need to see that full package tonight, especially against a guy like Mads, because, look, he has it as well. Um, he told us, I think my fighting IQ is the biggest tool I have tonight. You know Mads well. You've trained with him before. So what do we need to know about him going into this and what it's like to fight him? He's a madman. He's a madman. 
man. I've been, I've been waiting all day to You're use crazy. that, by the way. <laughs> no, he's phenomenal on the ground. Now, I've, I've worked him a little bit on the feet, but mainly a lot of the grappling aspects. So when it comes to the wrestling, he's short in stature, so it's harder to get your body up underneath him when you're trying to lift and elevate him. So when you, that happens, you need to start trying to break him down. That's also hard. What he utilizes very well is a lot of fighters get up by using the half guard position, and he loves that Japanese necktie. And so he goes right from that position to a Darce, to an Anaconda. He mixes it all up very well in those transitions. And when you turn too much, he takes your back. What he did to Saul Rogers, and he gets those hooks in, and he just slowly and starts dis dismantling you in every position. You know, from our diehard fans, they play drinking games, and we can talk about that because we're not on the main card yet. And it's with Tolong and Lakey, but I think now every time you say he's a mad man, yes. it, it's going to be the same thing. That, that only implies they'll win Mads fights, though. That's what's going to happen. I know, but still. Tolong and Lakey, I use it every opportunity I get. So if you guys are at home doing this game, Tolong and Lakey. Okay, there we go. Uh, that's, that's all we need from the desk. We're going to go back tomorrow with our last prelim of the night. Excuse me while I take a drink of my water after hearing Tall, Long, and Lanky. Hey, we've got the feature attraction for the Bellator 276 prelims. We've got the 9-1 Alex Polizzi taking on the 7-3 Jose Augusto in a compelling light heavyweight attraction. And now, ready to make his way to the cage, Jose Cucu Augusto. Believe it or not, John, Jose Augusto, he turns 30 on March 28th. <laughs> <laughs> the parade of March birthdays at Bellator 270 continues. Though. Continues. Uh, he is coming off a loss to Anthony Johnson at Bellator 258 last May. But, man, first person to almost knock out Rumble Johnson before he was stopped by Anthony Johnson. And while we have a quick moment, want to wish Rumble Johnson a speedy recovery. Hope to see him back in the Bellator MMA cage. But more importantly, hope to see him healthy. Tell us about Augusto and what he brings to the Bellator MMA cage in his third fight under this promotion's banner. Now, what Augusto brings is he brings a dynamite stand-up game where he's got power in his hands. He moves well. His ground game is not bad. Ever since he went and started training with the Pitbull brothers, Brothers. This guy has turned into a monster. There he hurts. Rumble Johnson almost puts Rumble out. Rumble somehow works his way and fights through it. But this is the power that Goo Goo has. And matter, look, I'm telling you right now, you get hit by the right hand of Rumble Johnson. That can happen to anyone and has happened many times. But Jose Augusto is the real deal. This guy can fight and he is in for a big fight against Alex Polizzi, the winner of this is really putting themselves on the map in the light heavyweight division. All seven wins coming inside the distance. Five knockouts, two submissions for Augusto. He's ready to go. And now his opponent, Alex E.C. Polizzi. Polizzi has been kitten down all right, and he has had plenty of success. Has won nine of his first to ten fights. Has bounced back for his own, from his only loss to Julius Unglickskas with back-to-back -back victories, including one over Grant Neal at Bellator 266 last September. Of course, Unglickskas will face former Bellator light heavyweight champion Phil Davis coming up in our co-feature on the Bellator 276 main card. But Polizzi, again, 30 years of age, John, and there's plenty to like. There's a lot to like about Alex Easy Polizzi because this guy can fight in all ranges. His wrestling is good, his stand-up is good. He will take a shot. He had the setback against Anglitskis, but that was a fight where he just was not able to figure out the standing game of Anglitskis. But this is him against Grant Neal, and these guys went at it. This was a war back and forth. Both guys taking huge damage, showing unbelievable heart. 
right there, the power bomb by Alex Polizzi. Undefeated except for one time here in Bellator. Three and one. This guy can really fight. His ground and pound makes the godfather of ground and pound, Mark Coleman, smile ear to ear because this <laughs> ground and pound is nasty. Let's take a look at the numbers for this feature preliminary bout at Bellator 276. You know, the real thing to look at here, that six foot to six foot three, the one person that gave Polizzi problems was the tall Julius Anglickskis. So we'll see if he's figured that out now. Here's Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Family Arena, time has come to conclude the Bellator 276 prelims, and we'll do it with three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot three, weighing in 206 pounds. His professional record: seven wins, three losses. From uh, Paolo Alfonso Bahia, he fights out of uh, Natal, Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil, presenting the coup, Jose Augusto. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 204.4 pounds. As a professional, he's near perfect, nine victories, just one defeat fighting out of Las Vegas by way of Madison, Wisconsin, Alex E.Z. Polizzi. And the referee in charge, Kerry Hatley. Alex Polizzi has four first round finishes, two knockouts, two submissions. Jose Augusto, six first round finishes, four knockouts, Two submissions. Right, this is what you work for. You ready? You know ready? what I'm Let's trying go. to tell you. <laughs> Don't blink! Bell and round number one. And there, a right hand that cracked the jaw of Belize, and Belize ate it like it was nothing. Yeah, but it definitely got his attention, and he cannot take a whole bunch of shots like that because that was just past his guard. And you heard the noticeable thwack. Yeah, you heard it because it landed. And now the sprawl by Augusto defending the takedown attempt of Polizzi, who went the takedown route after tasting the power of Augusto. And you saw that sprawl, and you saw Polizzi's head get smashed into the canvas. That did not feel good. Coming up off on an Iranian lift. Beautiful job by Polizzi. Looks like he's going to do it more. He dropped her. Put a wrestle move, but instead ends up side control on Augusto. And Polizzi turning things around in a hurry. And Polizzi utilizing that wrestling base to say, you know what, I'm not going to be in the stand-up with this guy. He hits too hard. Let me take this where I feel more comfortable. And that's where he's at on the ground right now in a beautiful side control position. Fighting out of Beloit, Wisconsin, Polizzi, with the most celebrated high school wrestler at Beloit Memorial High, went on to be a three-time NCAA qualifier at Northwestern University. But he's hoping to show that he's not just a one-dimensional fighter. Minute and a half gone here in the opening round. Yeah, Gugu trying to control that arm with his legs and stuff. He's going to have to figure out. He's going to have to let go of that now. Just start to work yourself at least back to a half guard, then get to full guard. Right now, Belize's in his world. This is where he feels comfortable. And he has to make the most out of this dominant position from side control. Augusto trying to explode his hips. And there's the neon belly right into full mount, but a nice sweep by Augusto. Beautiful timing by Jose Augusto to take that, sweep him over. And that's what happens when you go to mount many times. Guys don't want to go to mount because of that very scenario, that same scenario right there that you just saw. One time plum, and then the elbow across the face of Polizzi Augusto. Delivering some high-octane offense early here in the opening round. Yeah, look, Augusto in the stand-up. He's got power in his hands, and he does. He's got a good Muay Thai plum, but he cannot allow Polizzi to get into his legs. If Polizzi's able to get to his legs, he's going to put him on his butt like you're seeing right here. He cannot lay flat down. He needs to put himself back with his back up against that cage and utilize that cage as a balance point to get himself back to his feet. Augusto did his homework telling us he knows that Polizzi relentless on his pursuit of the takedown. Polizzi back in mount. 
And Polizzi looking to make the most of the full mount position. Wants to deliver that nasty ground and pound that he's known for, but Augusto doing the good job. Well, was doing the good job of controlling posture until now. Augusto needs to figure out if he's gonna push off of that cage. He needs to buck those hips and get that weight going forward with Polizzi, but he's gotta at least take away one of those posting arms. Augusto winner of Five of his last six again. Losing to Anthony Rumble Johnson last May. Polizzi is looking to extend his win streak to three, but Augusto actually, John, doing a good job of really minimizing damage from full mount for the most part. Yeah, he's starting to eat it now because he's pushing off. He's taking his hands and he's opening up his face to put his hands on hips to try to push Polizzi back. The second time he did it, Polizzi had already figured out, okay, I'm waiting for it. And here Polizzi again looking to go once again to full mount right now. Could just from this back now, ground and pound and looking to put the hooks in. Alex Polizzi, who does have a rear naked choke submission win, but he's he's content on delivering damage from mount. Well, he is he's delivering some big shots at times. Some of those are getting through. Gusto's been able to block some, but a lot of those shots did get through. Polizzi's putting it on him right now. Alex Polizzi putting it on Jose Augusto. Augusto neutralizing his posture, hoping to escape, and he will escape the first round, but a tough start for the Brazilian. Easy up, man. And while Polizzi didn't exactly make it look easy, he was <laughs> definitely full value for your 10-9 score on your unofficial scorecard. Oh, no doubt. He gets it, but you can take a look at that. That was a tale of two fights because when it was on right the feet, hand, right? yeah. look at so right Augusto away, was doing away, good and he was no landing best. heavy shots. Polizzi, once it hit the ground, he was the dominant fighter and he definitely wins that round 10-9. He's loading up that right hand. Yeah. Get right underneath it, just like we did before. He sprawls. Push him up against the cage. Yeah. Right. Você agarrou com ele ali. Esquece essa joelhada no clinch. Na no clinch. Volta pro seu jogo. O seu jogo é na meia. Back with that. Hump with that. Yep. Right. And he gets his hands on your hips. Right. So if you keep those knees, keep those knees high, he goes on those hips. Big hands. Give me some big shots. You good? Good. Go right there, bro. Polizzi's a corner addressing what he should do if Augusto gets back to trying to push on the hips to get out of that mount position. Bell and round number two. Alex Polizzi, Jose Augusto. Oh! for a submission from his back. Go for the arm. Looking for that arm bar. He lost it. Guys, got to Looking for his first arm bar submission win. Got to extend the hips. You don't just pull on the arm. Extend the hips. The hips are up in the air. What about the, the fighting arm. spirit of Alex Polizzi refusing to surrender? This is what I loved about Alex Polizzi when he fought Grant Neal. Same exact 
taking anything away from Alex Polizzi, but not the highest fight IQ from Jose Augusto. Oh, big mistake. Polizzi stepping over in the mount on top. That's a nice job by Polizzi. This can give him some time to recover from the heavy shots he's taken, but Augusto had him hurt, and it's the wrestling of Polizzi that has given Augusto problems. He should have backed off, made Polizzi get to his feet. But these are the moments that you go back and you can look at and you'll see it. But at the top of the fight, it just wasn't there for him. After absorbing what would normally be a knockout-inducing knee strike, Alex Polizzi somehow finds himself in top position and taking it to Jose Augusto. How did we get here, John? Uh, I'm telling you right now, Alex Polizzi couldn't tell you because I don't think he's going to remember much Unbelievable. Of Instincts. Adrenaline and the, the heart of a warrior, Alex Polizzi. Fighting out of Beloit, Wisconsin. The chosen few gym and extreme control. Ground and pound. His calling card, Alex Polizzi, despite being bloody, despite being rattled, is trying to vanquish Jose Augusto. This is the second time Augusto has almost had his opponent out in the Bellator cage and is now in trouble and almost in the point of losing the fight. He rattled Rumble Johnson, had him hurt, ended up being stopped. He rocked Alex Polizzi with a nasty knee and is now on the verge of perhaps being finished via ground and pound with less than a minute left in the second round. Polizzi is, he is amazing right now because he is tired. He's been hurt and he just keeps on grinding. Gusto being as tough as you can be. No give up in him. Polizzi switch it. Man, Polizzi's just having his way with a Gusto on the ground despite being nailed you're so, upstairs. Paul, you're so right. He is just having his way. He is moving around on it. Oh, nasty elbows to the rib cage of a Gusto. An incredible round. An incredible. second round, but Alex Polizzi ends up on top, heading to the third. Wow! Like you said, Alex Polizzi might not remember a lot of it, but what a memorable middle frame for Polizzi. Let's take a look at what started this whole thing. Here comes the fly knee. Look at how oh. it lands flush, more. I mean, you can't land it any better. Polizzi eats that. He is seriously hurt, but he sticks with it. Check this out. That lands as clean as you're ever going to find. That's amazing that it did not put Alex Polizzi out. That jaw should be tested for titanium, Look John. at this. Look at this. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. Take a look at this. In real. Let's see real speed. Watch how fast. Oh, oh. And then it goes, he's on top, he's got the arm bar. But he doesn't do the right things. Take a look at the legs, but little things make the difference. Polizzi comes out on top, and from that point, he puts it on Augusto. This has been an amazing display by both guys. You grow by overcoming right, adversity, round, Alex. Right, Polizzi right. must feel like a giant heading into round three. What a fight. And what a second round it was. And now for Jose Augusto, wasted opportunity in that second stanza. Oh, absolutely. You know, things led to mistakes that put him in bad positions because he was in control that round. He had that round. He had the fight. Just didn't use that fight IQ that we talk about all the time to think about how to put Polizzi in a bad position. Polizzi staring at Augusto has recovered as much as can be expected and showed that in that second round while continuing to take the fight to Augusto. Looks for the takedown, the sprawl by Augusto, but immediately Polizzi takes the back. Yeah, that was the sprawl, but you saw Polizzi come out under, and now he's got the back. And Alex Polizzi take a back. After almost being finished, 
Alex Polizzi storms back to finish Jose Augusto recording his second always, rear naked choke one. submission yeah. his fifth submission yeah. win overall ER he is now 10 and one it's, it's with eight Feel finishes it. none yeah, more memorable than this one oh, <laughs> this is a fight they will talk about for a long time this is that last round you see Augusto gets the he gets the sprawl but please he just ducks out under comes out on the back and right away locks in the rear naked choke and Augusto is just he's exhausted from the prior activity of the first and second round nothing there to stop it chokes locked in that's a beautiful win by Alex Polizzi. Amazing. And the third time go. that Augusto's forced to tap as we look at Polizzi's Maybe corner. Maybe next stretch him out. He's stretching. There you go. Oh, the ebb and flow of mixed martial arts, one of the reasons why it is arguably the greatest show on earth, John. I mean, it's incredible what we witnessed tonight, courtesy of Alex Polizzi and Jose Augusto. I mean, yeah. What, what, what do you say when you yes. got a guy who's had a fight against Anthony, Anthony Rumble, Rumble Johnson, Johnson almost, knocks almost, knocks him out, almost knocks him out, almost knocks out the verge of victory right there. Hard luck, hard knocks. <laughs> look at this is the one. This is a look at he's got Rumble Johnson on stanky legs. He has got him almost out, and he was unable to finish that based upon he just couldn't get Rumble out of that fight with another shot, and then Rumble ends up. Oh. Putting him out with that, and Polizzi, in a in a weird way, has come back and done the wow. same thing. Look at that flying knee. This was tonight. He had that. That was a huge shot. Polizzi in trouble, and here comes the end with Polizzi getting the rear naked choke. The Brazilian on the receiving end of the Mata Leon, the lion roars tonight in the form of Alex Polizzi. Anything but easy, but wow. An incredible reversal of fortunes here tonight. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap by way of a rear naked choke, just 49 seconds into round number three by submission. Alex is Let's go to Big John McCarthy. Brother, I am so impressed with you. Do you even remember the second round? I think I ended up on top, but outside of that, things got a little crazy. Okay, I want to tell you that was just an amazing fight. If you can see the replay on this, I, if I could turn you around and you can see anything, there was some unbelievable moments in this fight you had a beautiful first round your wrestling was a difference he was actually getting to you on the feet you took him down you controlled all of that beautiful work the second round starts and you end up getting hit with a knee do you remember being in trouble from the knee that he landed no but maybe that's, okay. that's for the better because I, I mean the, the uh, according to my memory the whole round i was on top and pushing that pace so well, we're going to go with that. We're going to say that you were on top of the whole round because you survived a vicious knee. You were in trouble, and he was going after you, and your tenacious attitude, you never, never say die. You just stuck with it, and you ended up on top and doing great work in the second round. Going into the third round, how were you feeling? You know, uh, I can feel it now a little bit in the cheek. I'm guessing that's where the knee hit. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm blessed enough to have that background in wrestling, and you mentioned that tenacity, even while maybe not sure if everything functions up top, but it's just the, there it is, that looked nice, yeah. Uh, e even then, you get a little bit of the, the reflexes of the body still working and going, uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing, keeping me in control, keeping me in the fight, so. Really glad to be here, really glad to earn that W. That was a huge win, the rear naked choke, finally putting an end to it. But I want to tell you, one of the best fights I've ever seen by someone showed incredible heart. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Alex Easy Polizzi. And he prays from a man who's seen it all, Big John McCarthy, and I echo his sentiments, an incredible performance by Alex Polizzi to put the cap 
on the Bellator 276 prelims. Let's go back to the fight desk. Man, Mora, what high praise, Josh, from Big John. They're one of the best fights he has ever seen. John has seen it all, yeah, and that was incredible. John's as old as dirt, so he's been around forever. He's seen all of these things. <laughs> no, look, the bottom line is they call him easy, but he didn't make it easy tonight. But his fight IQ is what got him through this fight. When he got rocked, he closed the distance. He tried to grab, tried to hold, tried to slow this fight down. That's exactly what he did. Now, Gugu made some mistakes as well, but I'm just being honest. Alex Polizzi fought a great fight in terms of how to recover. And if you're a young fighter, pay attention to what he did. He did a lot of good things. Now, he made mistakes while he was wrong, but he did a lot of good things to make sure he stayed in the fight. Only one sure, loss in his career. It was to Julius Anglickskis, who is in our co-main event. That just goes to show how talented he is. All right. There, there's a lot going on on Twitter right now, on social media, because we have had some outstanding finishes here at Bellator MMA tonight. One of them we want to address. Cody Law predicted his knockout at 117 of the first round. Apparently, he wrote this in his hotel room before coming here tonight. We had a guy who's very high at the top at Bellator MMA. He went and talked to his manager, said, yes, this is true. He called a shot that actually happened. That's what's unfolded tonight. Josh, what a finish for Cody Law. Just Babe Ruth style. Let me just point <laughs> out to the side and just start calling my shots. But he looked phenomenal. Phenomenal. It was the right hand, then he slipped under, under, came back with another right hand, and then he pushed the pace. When he hit him and dropped him with the left hook, what I loved the most is he cut the angle to the right and stepped and sat down on that right hand. That was the finishing blow. Beautifully done by Cody Law. We were starting to see people call their shots a little bit more. Uh, if you remember, Roman Feraldo, not tonight, but the last fight, he pointed to the guy before he had the flying knee, then he got the knockout there. Uh, but let's talk about Roman Feraldo because he was amazing. Amazing tonight, creating more viral moments, and he is still undefeated. Yeah, he's like just the walking viral spread around the internet right now in terms of everything he does. It's absolutely amazing. I'm just simply saying, he's got, I'm going to go to the glasses over all this stuff, okay? He's uh, he's absolutely amazing. When seven knockouts. Seven, seven knockouts, fights, seven knockouts. Seven finishes. Two of them flying knees. He he's is point. phenomenal. He points, he walks him down, boom, right up the middle between the guard. Beautifully done, and tonight, what he did is he dropped him with a jab, boom, follows up, points at him right there, Cameron was behind him, so for us, we saw it, points at him, lets him know this is over, it's done. He is just a walking highlight reel, and I gotta be honest, I cannot wait to watch him fight on the main car and up his level of competition. I'm, I would love to see that MVP fight happen. Were you ever gutsy enough to point at someone? No. <laughs> I never had power like that, though, either. So I could, yeah, I never. Uh, Josh Thompson, Amanda Guerra. Okay, we got a great show coming up for you tonight on Showtime. It's already been incredible. Here is your main card. You do not want to miss a single one of these fights. Bellator 276, uh, Adam Borch, Mads Brunel there at the very top. Whoever wins this will be the number one contender in the featherweight division. We'll see you at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Showtime. Bellator kicks into high gear. What a comeback! With two top-ranked featherweights vying for a guaranteed title shot. Oh! Flying knee knockout artist Adam Boric. And there's that knee! Faces a red-hot Mads Brunel. Fantastic finish by Brunel. Lux, former champ Bill Davis makes his return. Take the pain that the sound is rough. Against the heavy fists of Julius Angliscus. Bellator MMA, tonight live on Showtime, where warriors rule.
Gallagher. I was very complimentary of the fact that Taylor was not putting his foot all the way down on the gas pedal. I believe that has now changed. It looks like he's going to go for it. Let's see what he can do here. A nice left hook. I, I like the shot by Boris. The discipline of Boris here. It's a 23 year old fighter. Not getting caught up in the brawl. Yep. He's waiting for his moments. Hands up. Using his awareness to stay out of trouble. He wants to be the face of MMA here in Hungary. Another nice left hook. His timing. Taylor coming in. Taylor taking big shots a matter of time before he paid a price. Boric swarming him. On his back, he's going to throw some punches. Just trying to distract Taylor so Boric can get his hand under the chin and to the far shoulder. Right now, Boric's hips are squarely got behind got Taylor. It. He's he got, got that it. hand under. Taylor in deep trouble, and we're done. That was a clinic. Silva does a great job of coming forward, ducking under, and then finishing with that left. Yeah, nice, beautiful change of levels by Silva getting down there. He had a nice combination to open up Borges, then change level, but he's in trouble here. Borges has got great position, and he's got that in time. That's tight, Mike. And it's all over! Adam Borges with the submission victory! Wow! And Curran... Didn't really get hurt, he got dropped. Not hurt, he clamped down on the left arm with his arm and controlling the wrist. There's some hammer fist fight. Right. Boric, less than 30 seconds left in the round. Boric looking to close right the right show. Curran showing up, blocking. Hammer fist by Boric. And Curran, the veteran, trying to neutralize the youngster, trying to survive the round. Curran blocking a lot of those blows, but some of them are getting through. A lot of them are getting through. Here comes Adam Borges fly knee. Watch him bring that left knee up. Boom. It touches him. I don't think it hurt him that bad, but he was already being pushed back. You see the heavy elbows down here. He started to change what Pat Kern was doing. Then he becomes nothing more than a guy accepting damage. And that's why you hear Frank Trick saying you gotta fight back. He doesn't see it, and he made up his mind that he was stopping the fight just as the bell rang. Coming up next, after the main event. Oh, All right, that goodness. hurt me. Wow, you that hear right it. there, man, that hurts, and uh, the damage it's doing. Oh, good job. Took a couple extra blows only because of the quickness of what occurred. What an unbelievable finish by Adam Boric. Boom! Look at that knee. As soon as it connected, he was out. Switches, boom! Right behind the ear. Beautiful knockout by Adam Borsch. What an explosion. Made into the second round, and Boric is going to have to try to find a way to get back to his feet and create separation. He does need to create separation. He's all over him like a spray tan. <laughs> He's got that good tan for Florida. Come on. Man. A minute 13 now left, and there's that head kick. And now there's the knee. There's the knee. He caught him. Burridge just caught Pico with the knee. Burridge defeats Eric Pico. Mamma mia. Oh, my God. Incredible turn. Madison Square Garden. Drops. Pico got dropped Nothing with that left there. knee. That was a huge shot. He's starting to try to defend himself, but he's unable to stop what Adam does. That shot right there, look at his arms. Flops down, he is out at that moment. All right, gentlemen, this is what it's all about. You ready to go? You ready to go? Let's go to war. Come on. The felon round number one. Joe Warren in the black trunks. The champion, Joe Soto in the white trunks. Kerry Hatley is the referee. 
Bellator history being made tonight here at the Majestic Theater in San Antonio, Texas. The first ever defense of a Bellator world title. For Bellator by winning the season one tournament. Good left by Soto, good right over the top. And Soto really showing his dominance in the boxing. Doing a little Diaz impression, throwing his hands up. Good left by Soto. Oh, another good left. Warren turns his back. He has a bad habit of doing that. He did that against Pitbull. Watch the back of the head. Watch the back of the head. Soto getting off with his shots. Man, Soto just oozing confidence right now. Another good left. Stiff left jab by Joe Soto. Warren reaching with his takedown. Oh, good, good uppercut. Warren takes a big step backwards. One-way traffic at the moment for the champion, Joe Soto. Soto cannot play here, though. If he gets Warren hurt, he has to finish him. We saw against Pitbull how badly he was hurt, and he came back. Soto can't make the same mistake. Another good left and a right. This is Huge a boxing, uppercut. This is a boxing mismatch. Joe Soto is having his way now with Joe Warren. By his own admission, he will tell you he's not going to win a 25-minute stand-up fight. Now, he might not win a five-minute stand-up fight, Sean. He is taking a beating here. Another big uppercut with the right by Soto. You see, when Joe's in trouble, he starts reaching. He goes back to his Greco-Roman wrestling. He doesn't move What's his up? head. What's he up? doesn't have the boxing instincts to box defensively. Just vicious shots by Soto. Round number two of this Bellator World Featherweight Championship fight. Right, here we go, round two, let's go. Joe Warren is in the black trunks, the champion Joe Soto in the white trunks. Jimmy, you have the unofficial scorecard. Okay, I've taken, I oh my God, good right hand by Warren. Now Warren pouncing and looking to finish with hammer fist, raining down the shots. Watch the back of the head. Soto now turning there his you back. Clubbing shots. Unbelievable! Never count Joe Warren out of a fight ever. Marshall pulling out of that single leg attempt. Good. Oh, nice right hand. Marshall. Marshall opening up his striking. Lays another big shot. John McCarthy stepped in. Is that the end of the fight or the end of the round? Oh, it's the end of the round. Faisal thought he Wow. Won. And now he's being told you did not win. That is the end of round one. The Pitbull right now does not know where he is. Almost finished by Daniel Weichel at the end of the first round. Unbelievable. McCarthy clearly stepped in after the bell to indicate round one. But again, Weichel, he couldn't hear the bell just like we couldn't hear it. He thought he won the fight. That Pitbull did not have his legs under him at the start of this round. He's got to take time to clear his head. Great replay from our outstanding crew. And you heard the bell clearly. I think that was a good non-call by John McCarthy. Absolutely. But Vice will try to make the most of it, landing with, oh my God! Time encountered, and a lightning strike come from behind win for Patricio Pitbull. He retains the world title just like that. Another spectacular comeback for Pitbull, this time on the feet. I am stunned. I do not believe it. Everything going Daniel Vice's way. Steady diet of right hands from Carlisle looking to get his hooks in. Carlisle's good to back, but backdoor escape by Moret, and he stacks Carlisle. Nice job of stepping over the leg by Dan Moret to control the position and keep Spike Carlisle down. He was getting up. Definitely uh, appeared to be going for that, although now he's going for a guillotine. He's going for that guillotine choker with the fence there that could create a lot of pressure. Spike needs to be very careful. Carlisle's with his hands on that leg. That's not a good position to have your hands. Seven of Moret's 15 wins have been via submission, including a guillotine choke, but Carlisle blood now as well on the body of Carlisle as Moret continues to go for the submission. Moret's going for that submission. He keeps driving him back, but Carlisle's out of it. 
nice knee to the body by Dan Moret. Resiliency by Carlisle. Final 60 seconds of what has been a frenetic first round. One in which Dan Moret has had the advantage of Moret landing that left cross as Carlisle crushing space, but then just swinging wildly. Yeah. Oh, that's a kick by Moret. He went for the elbow that just missed there. Looks for the takedown. And Moret looks for the guillotine. Go back to the guillotine. That's on tight. It's got eight seconds to survive. It's put a lot of pressure on it. Spike's okay. The first five minutes now. Let's see how well his conditioning is as he gets tagged by Moret knee. And again, furious exchange to kick off round two. Both guys get a little wild there, Dan Moret. In a position, he lands a shot, but then comes in too quick. Spike counters, lands a clean shot. Carlisle able to take a little bit of the sting off, but then the kick in a series of punches. He's in trouble. The attack. He's getting tired of those kicks. Oh, and the knee as Carlisle was going for the takedown. Kicks have landed to the body. Carlisle sucking air right now. Moret needs to keep on pushing the pace. And Moret tags Carlisle. Backs him up, front kick to the face. Look, the kicks of Moret have been a big difference maker in this fight. Be it to the leg, to the body, or to the head. He needs to go back to using those kicks. They've been very effective in damaging Spike Carlisle. Remember, Carlisle, 11 of his 12 wins via finish, and there was an elbow strike. Oh, oh big shot shot to the body. Knee. That hurt his shot, dropping Carlisle. Left hand across the temple. Uppercut by Carlisle. Uppercut as Moret jumped in. What a fight! Moret needs to go back to the body. If he goes back to the body, Carlisle is in trouble. Seasons beatings indeed between Moret and Carlisle. Not a lot of technique, but boy, are they swinging for the fences. The guts, the heart of Spike Carlisle as he's being mauled by these knees and punches from the head. Sensational second round. Carlisle desperately trying to stay in the fight, even going up for a half-hearted submission attempt. You cannot question the hardest by Carlisle, but let's not discount the dominance of Dan Moret. Absolutely right, Moro. This it was a dominant round. Carlisle making his Bellator MMA debut on short notice in the blue gloves. We'll have to pull out something almost as dramatic as his entrance to the Bellator MMA cage against Dan the Hitman Moret, who has been outstriking Carlisle up to this point. Definitely has been. Oh, nice straight left hand. Nice straight left hand. And left hook and right by Carlisle. That got her. Moret is staggered. Back comes by Carlisle. Rising from the ashes. On that. He's still a little bit wobbly, but Spike Carlisle is exhausted. And Moret sitting down now on his punches, leading with the left cross. Already making everyone's favorite month of December a month to remember what a scrap, John. Dan Moret, Spike Carlisle, they've been going at it like this since the opening round. Oh, since the very first time they touched gloves. Spike's going down to the ground. Smart move by Dan Moret. Take your time, get position, and just start wearing on him. Moret training at Henry Cejudo's gym. Fight ready, more than ready. Moret wearing down Carlisle. <laughs> trying to improve his position, trying to pass. Now has a back foot to scramble by Carlisle. Carlisle with the Iranian lift, bringing him up. He gets position. Oh, Carlisle's getting his hooks in on his back. Going for the rear neck and choke. Pass the midpoint of the round. That's tight. High drama. He could get it. He's just got to hold that squeeze. Looking to pull off the mother of all comebacks in his Bellator MMA debut. Moret literally seeing red. Moret is still there.
Opening round for Queenie Josh in your yeah, book. 100%. First round, he did it in this round. He set up his kicks with his punches. Got Queely under massive pressure here. The veteran who has never been stopped on the rear naked. He's never been finished before. He's got his hips up on top. He's cranking on the neck. Nothing yet, but doing some damage. Queely is in trouble here. This is close to being stopped. This is close to being stopped right here. Referee's having a long look at this. Elbow there from Scope. Wheely hanging on here. He's working on that side choke. He had a good position, didn't get it all the way, so he let it up. Laying down the strikes right now. Quilly hasn't fully recovered yet. Choosing his shots. You, well, last thing you want to do is try to tie yourself out, try to get the finish, and then not get it. Someone like Quilly would come back. Long time left in the round as well, which is bad news for Quilly. Scott continues that ground and pound and the hammer fist, and he again looks to get into position for the finish. Set up that side choke again. Oh, we let it go. He's still in that mountain position. He's trying to frame him away with the face, trying to land the strikes. He's keeping his knees pinched tight so Quilly can't roll side to side and start to work on the escape. Gonna wear Quilly down. Scope doing a good job of keeping the pressure on. Oh, and the reverse of Quilly. Biggest roll of the night as Quilly. This is what I was talking about. Scope did a lot of work trying to get the finish. How tired is he now? And now he's looking for the finish. Scope is home. And Queenie in the most dramatic fashion turns it round and wins. You saw that Daly blocked it, but he felt it too. Oh, he's a big shot. We have seen Daly do this to his opponents, but not many can do it to him. Omasi is landing big shots. That left hand just needs to be a jackhammer right now. Ball doesn't have the sense right now to block many shots. He's trying to hold on, trying to use that jujitsu that he has gotten good at. He needs to slow the progression of Omasi down. Well, it was Sabaho Masi who landed the first big bombs of this fight. And give credit to the 38-year-old Paul Daly. Again, 60-second professional fight. A lot of miles on the odometer, and he weathered, weathered the initial storm. Well, he's weathering the storm, but he's wearing that. So the experience, huge edge for Daly. Power, they both tasted each other's striking ability. They have both hurt each other. And total strikes landed, John. And take a look at that, 27. Oh, Homasi gets in trouble. Daly dropping the left and Paul Daly defeats Sabah Homasi here in round number two. What a comeback for Paul Daly. Coming off a knockout victory over Kaya Sakura last New Year's Eve, where he became a two-time rising champion as Pettis landed the right hand, avenging a knockout loss to Asakura. Standouts at flyweight at 125, but really coming into their own here now at 135. You gotta look at, you know, Sergio Pettis has a win over the current UFC champion in Bantamweights. And Horaguchi gets the takedown. That's the what's important. It's not that Sergio does not know how to defend the off kicks. And Horaguchi has Pettis back. But it takes all of his offense in the stand up away. Former K1 lightweight tournament runner up, Ren Hiramoto, who gave Pettis plenty of insight. 
into Horaguchi, only 23 years of age. Duke Rufus, and his coach calls him one bad mofo. He's right about oh, spinning back kick to the midsection. Connects for Horaguchi. How can he stop, the, mitigate the movement of Horaguchi? Oh, he's do, what he's doing right now is right. He's not getting caught up in all the motion. He is being very tactical and very composed and tight. But he needs to stop as far as moving backwards. When you see him moving backwards, he cannot do that and win this fight. He needs to come forward and he needs to create the angles by stepping where he believes Horaguchi wants to go. One, two, by Horaguchi. Just like that. And the left hook. And there, Pettis with the kick. Always remains calm, stays true to his game plan, and gets knocked off his feet momentarily by Horaguchi. Beautiful low kick by Horaguchi. It's not that Pettis has not been in there with guys that have the same type of movement. It's the speed factor with that movement that creates the problems. And changes levels and gets the takedown on Pettis. Does it with just technique, beautiful technique. That's what he went to American yes. Top Team for. And Pettis looking to get the Omoplata on. Horaguchi, but Horaguchi is a hefty veteran. He's got too much position right yep. now, but he needs to be careful of that up kick again. And he's dropping the ground and pound on Pettis. Lands a right hand before snatching the waist. Bit of a stalemate here, a minute and a half left in the second. And there's a couple of right hands from the back by Horaguchi. This is why you saw Pettis with that grip. The glove is like a big stopper on the end. It's very difficult to get your hand free, but once Horaguchi does, look at what he's doing. And he's trying to loosen up right there, John, as you saw. 20 seconds left in the round. And there's a right hand that lands for Horaguchi. It is his money shot jail. It lands for Pettis. Oh, nice check. Half kick by Pettis. That was checked by Horaguchi. That was a beautiful check. And the spinning back fist misses for Pettis. That through two rounds, Pettis has landed a total of nine strikes. A lot of volume, he's landed some heavy shots. Nice, clean left hand right there. Pettis needs to really start to open up. Horaguchi, incredibly accurate. Landing at a 59% clip now. And again, attacking the leg and backpedaling. You're just not sure where he's gonna go. There's a spinning back kick again, scores for Horaguchi. And Pettis unable to get on track. And Horaguchi snatching the single. Pettis feeding him with a few right uppercuts. Horaguchi started that with that jab. It landed cleanly. See him riding him on his hip. Horaguchi transitioned so fast. Took the back, riding the position. Not that Pettis is in any problem as far as the submission right at this moment. Horaguchi just locks things in so fast, moves to where he wants, forces his opponent to go to the direction he wants, and then takes it. Nice job by Sergio Pettis to get himself out. Again, Horaguchi going downstairs with the kick. There's a counter right by Pettis. Unofficially, through three rounds, Sergio Pettis has yet to land in double digits in any round. That's amazing. He has dominated this fight. Right now, I have Sergio Pettis down by three rounds. Only two rounds left. That means that he needs to do something special in these next two rounds if he wants to walk away with that belt in hand. And we are not seeing the jab that Duke Rufus wanted Pettis to try to use to break Horaguchi's rhythm. And there's a jab from Horaguchi that lands. Oh, he's out. He's out. Are you kidding me? Sergio Pettis pulling it out like we talked about. He had to do something spectacular. Horaguchi winning this entire fight. Take a look. Misses with the kick, but hits the spinning back fist. He is out. Look at that shot right on the jawline. Horaguchi is out going down.
change the angle and create more pressure than he did. There's the tap! Hamasi does it! Sullivan is doing an outstanding job. Heavy hip pressure. Doesn't have that hook right now, but it's a heavy hip pressure mark that's keeping Ben Parrish where he's at. A lot of damage done by Sullivan Cully in this round. This is exactly what you want to see out of him. Ben Parrish is going to have to start to move. Well, it's obvious that Sullivan Cully has overcome his performance anxiety and fears of not competing like he can because he was brilliant tonight. Sullivan Cully coming up on two minutes gone in the opening frame, and uh, Lucas Brennan continues to show why they're so high. He's known as Skywalker after all. Well, this is the one position. Look how he's starting to set up that choke. Now he's in top. You see that arm to the side. Boy, it's a beautiful, beautiful use of technique right here. That squeeze is on. This is not going to be easy for Ben Lugo to stay with. He is in trouble. He's trying to push on that arm to give him a little bit of space. Get some air in there. Yep. There it is. And beautiful job by Lucas Brown. Look to stand in front of him and throw leather. Well, he got stunned by that. <laughs> he said, "Here, come out here, let's throw." Well, beautiful Be elbow. That was a big one. That elbow strike really just hurt Shut. That's why he turned. He's in trouble now. Mikhailov really needs to start opening up. Mikhailov from back mount, reigning in the ground and pound, left and right. 